Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to call our meeting to order, and I'll call on board member Deborah Knapper. We will begin our recognitions um, tonight um, by honoring the life of a former board member who recently passed away. Dr. Sandra Alexander died Friday after a courageous battle with cancer. Dr. Alexander was the first African American to win an at-large seat on the board and served from 2008 to 2016. She was a strong advocate for the district's reading and literacy efforts and worked with her sorority, the Beta Iota Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated to raise funds to support these efforts. She was an educator and leader in the community and our heartfelt condolences go out to her family. At this time, I will read aloud a resolution honoring Dr. Alexander's life and work. Whereas Dr. Sandra Carlton Alexander, a dedicated Guilford County Schools leader, educator, community and civic activist, author and entrepreneur, passed away on Friday, June 10th, 2022, after a brave journey with cancer. And whereas from December 2008 until 2016, Dr. Alexander faithfully executed the duties as a dedicated member of the Guilford County Board of Education, serving as the board's at-large representative for two consecutive terms. And whereas Dr. Alexander was the first African-American candidate to win an at-large position to the Guilford County Board of Education. And whereas exonerating leadership and advocacy for students and families of a diverse Guilford County, Dr. Alexander served on various board committees, including chair of the Business Advisory Committee, co-chair of the Legislative Committee, member of the Achievement Gap Committee, member of the Joint Capital Budget Committee, with the Guilford County Board of County Commissioners and liaison to communities and schools. And whereas having a passion for oration literacy and writing in 2013, pioneered the first donation from her sorority, the Beta Iota Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated to support the district's reading initiative. And whereas receiving various awards as an educator for many years, it was through this pathway that Dr. Alexander demonstrated a true love for teaching where she inspired youth to use education as preparation for adulthood. And whereas Dr. Alexander perpetuated dignity and strong ethical leadership as a community and civic activist employing intentional engagement to unify goals among local and statewide leaders and the community. And whereas with her tenacious acts of servant leadership, Dr. Alexander supported various programs to support families, such as the Reading Tutors and Read to Achieve programs involving faith-based entities and communities in school, SAT and PSAT initiatives to prepare students for college, the Saturday Heritage Academy designed to teach black history and culture, and launched tours for Guilford County students through her touring business, Greensboro Scenic Tours, just to name a few. And whereas the Guilford County Schools and the Guilford County Board of Education thank her family for sharing Dr. Carlton Alexander with us for nearly 15 years. And therefore, be it resolved, we, the Guilford County Board of Education, extend our heartfelt condolences to all those who knew and loved Dr. Alexander. Know that nearly 10,000 employees and 70,000 families grieve with the Alexander family and that our deepest hope is that all will take comfort in knowing that Dr. Alexander's legacy of love and leadership will remain cherished and impactful for generations to come. Dr. Alexander's daughter, Tanya, is with us here tonight. Um, Sonia and other family members who are present, will you please come forward so that we may express our condolences.
We will continue <clears throat> tonight's meeting by remembering three students who passed away this school year. Although we celebrate their lives and the positive impact they made on the Guilford County Schools family, our hearts are extended in grief to their loved ones. On behalf of the Board of Education, we'd like to extend our deepest condolences to the families, friends, and teachers of J. Colin Chambers, Jeremiah Hayes, and Zoe Molina. Just in time. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad to make it here in time for this. Um, Jacqueline Chambers was a friendly, humble, and caring young man who enjoyed hanging out with friends and playing video games like a typical kid. One of his teachers at Guilford E-Learning University Prep, Brian Howell, remembers driving a bus to pick him up for a weekly school enrichment program. Most students would mumble or grunt, good morning, but not Jacqueline. He always answered back, good morning, and would ask how Mr. Howell was doing. In the afternoons, he always wished Mr. Howell a good afternoon and looked forward to seeing him on the next bus ride. Mr. Howell said, my life has been truly blessed, is much richer for having known Jacqueline. Jeremiah Hayes was an energetic young man with a big personality to match. Daily, he demonstrated strength and perseverance, wanting to, wanting, uh, wanting to do things as independently as possible. He loved time with his peers, and each year quickly became the classroom favorite. Jeremiah's family was very important to him, and his mother showered him with love. For the staff of Haynes Inman Education Center, it was a pleasure and an honor to work with Jeremiah. Zoe was a sweet, loving child, full of life and love. She was a good friend to everyone in her class at Sedgefield Elementary School. She was very popular with her classmates and always had a smile on her face. Although Zoe had limited language, her bubbly personality allowed her to communicate beautifully with everyone. Zoe had gorgeous dark brown curly hair and sparkling brown eyes to match. She had an athletic build and was always doing flips and dancing around in the classroom. Zoe fought a long and courageous battle against a rare form of cancer, Ellen Sacoma although she was the only one on earth for a short period of time, she made a huge impact on everyone she met and she would truly be missed. Although we were only privileged to know these students for a brief amount of time in their own ways, they helped to create heartwarming memories that will be cherished forever. To honor these students, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. At this time, we would like to invite any family members or school representatives to come forward to receive condolences from the board. prayers are with you and your family.
finally tonight, <clears throat> we will recognize our June Employee of the Month, Brett Lloyd. Will you please come to the podium? It's 9 p.m. on a Wednesday. The workday has long been over for Brett Lloyd, lead custodian at Southwest High. But members of his team needed help back at the school, so without question, Lloyd returned and completed the job with them. It's that kind of dedication to the job that earned him the title of June Guilford County Schools Employee of the Month. Brett is the hardest working lead custodian we have had for years, writes math teacher Tracy Repco in her nomination. He replies immediately to all needs, big or small, and never hesitates. Whether it's a request for 40 tables set up or rearranging pallets of books or being somewhere to help at the drop of a dime, he is there. Brett is kind, polite, and dedicated to our school. Lloyd received a $50 gift card courtesy of the Greensboro JCs, and during the month of June, his photo will hang at the district central offices at Southwest High and at the Greensboro JCs office. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Kim Irby to read aloud the certificate honoring Brett. Guilford County Board of Education Certificate of Recognition presented to Brett Lloyd, Southwest High, for Employee of the Month, sponsored by Greensboro JCs, signed by Dr. Sharon L. Contreras and Board Chair Dina Hayes. Thank you. Brett, would you like to um, say a few words? We'd love to hear from you. Uh, just want to say thank you for the recognition and thank you to the staff who helps keep Southwest High School clean. Thank, thank you, you again. <laughs> We are now at public comments and we have uh, five people on our list. Um, the first speaker is Sherry Pikett and as you come to the podium, um, you have three minutes to make your comments when you have 15 seconds left an amber light will um, light up and then when your time is up, um, a red light will buzz to let you know. Sherry Pikett followed by Allison Cavanaugh Baumgardner. Nalini Banda followed by David Gilbert. Okay, Allison, you're, you're next, and then followed by Nalini Banda. Yeah, you just come on up to the podium, say your, say your name and address. My name is Allison Baumgartner, and I live on 312 Mary Street in Greensboro 27406. I use she, her pronouns, and for visual, visual description for anyone who may be listening, I'm a white female in my 30s who is 5'2", almost 5'2", almost wearing a pink dress. <laughs> and I just, I wanna start by thanking you all for your service as school board members and as leaders for all that you do to continue to support our public education system and our futures through our children's access to learning and opportunities. So thank you for listening. I'm here as a stepmom, a supporter of public education, and as a person who loves her community and wants the best future for all of our children, families, and community members. One hope I'd like to share is for us to explore the possibilities and potential for a justice framework where we all win, rather than just us or just people who look like me or share my identity. I'm here to say thank you and to encourage you to please stay the course in your efforts and decision making to build equity and invest in all of our communities, especially our communities who have been historically past and present disinvested in Investing in our communities, our schools, and our children's future, these investments grow and we all benefit. 
Our leader, Dr. Rosemary Allen, has said, it's not only about race, but it's always about race. And so investing in our children and our potential and possibility includes ensuring that a complete and accurate understanding of history is provided. Learning about the system of racism and race is important for myself, for our children, for our teachers, and our school leaders. As I think about math or science curriculums, it almost feels like common sense that we'd want to pursue truth in education and teaching history and current events that includes a curriculum that is accurate, complete, and helps our children process their experiences and feelings that is identity affirming. With this growing knowledge and understanding that can be provided, it can increase empathy, compassion for self and others, critical thinking, curiosity, deepening friendships and relationships through building trust and belonging. It can provide opportunities to understand similarities and differences and create spaces to listen and learn from each other. When we provide ourselves and our students with opportunities to grow, to be uncomfortable, we can be more empathetic people who are concerned with the well-being of all. And so having these curriculums, investing in our communities, and supporting the school bond in a way where we invest in our local community, from environmentally sustainable structures to using a fair and equitable process that looks at and reviews who has opportunity and who hasn't, who has opportunity to build the schools and who hasn't, who will benefit and who may be further harmed. So I thank you. There are no quick fixes, but there is a pathway forward. Thank you. Uh, Nalini Banda, we just demonstrate our support by doing this. <laughs> Um, Nalini Banda, da uh, followed by David Gilbert. David Gilbert, followed by Pat Bird. Welcome, and if you will say your name and address as you begin your comments, and then your, the timer will start. Welcome. Thank you, <clears throat> board members and Dr. Contreras. My name is David Gilbert. I live at 808 Twickenham Drive here in Greensboro. There is a Native American concept known as the seventh generation principle that urges us always to consider what the effects of decisions made now will be on seven generations into the future. Hold on to that. I'll come back to it. I'm here as a member of Greensboro Earthquakers, a local group of Quakers addressing issues of earth care. Several members of our uh, group have gathered outside this afternoon in the sun to uh, hold a worship circle, uh, holding you in the light for, as, as our, we Quakers say, for all of the challenges that you wrestle with, the complex issues affecting Guilford County schools today and in the future. Our focus is on environmental sustainability. We have joined with other local environmental groups to advocate for green schools. Our primary request is that you commit GCS to 100% clean energy by the year 2050. To get there requires action beginning now. And we're encouraged by several initial steps that you have recently taken. Several board members have indicated to us their enthusiastic support for sustainable energy practices. The administration has filled a long vacant position of energy engineer by a highly qualified engineer, Mr. Sun Nguyen. You recently added electric school buses to your uh, board legislative uh, agenda for the year, and your policy committee will be reviewing and updating the energy conservation management policy that this board actually passed in 2005. That forward-looking policy was written to guide all decisions about energy usage and in school construction and maintenance and operations. And now the $2 billion voter-approved funding for long-needed improvements to our school facilities offers you an ideal opportunity to demonstrate your serious commitment to moving toward the goal of 100% clean energy by 2050. One step is solar panels. We know it will be challenging to stretch the construction funds to meet the system's needs. Adding solar panels to roofs may seem like something that can be dropped all too easily. But as a long-term investment, it's a no-brainer since the energy savings more than pay for the system over time. And meanwhile, you'll be making a significant statement towards and a step towards achieving that 2050 goal. 
You'll also be modeling 21st century energy-wise construction. Don't overlook the multiplier effect of modeling. A school building itself is a powerful teaching tool to its students and to the community as a whole. Our schools can be leaders in modeling how we live and how we operate sustainably. So as you renovate school buildings that are 50 plus years old and build new ones to last for the next 50 plus years, serving not only today's students, but their children and their children's children. Remember, that's three generations of students and a very good step towards the seventh generation commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, our final speaker is Pat Bird. Is that going to be Field Bird? I thought so, but I just thought, well, maybe your friends call you Pat. Welcome, <coughs> Captain. Good afternoon, uh, board, uh, Dr. Contreras. Um, my name is Phil Bird. I reside at 5910 Bartley Drive, Greensboro. I'm also a candidate for Guilford County Sheriff. Uh, not too many uh, years ago, my office was right down the hall here from where we're standing. I spent four years as the Guilford County Sheriff's the commander over school resource division. And also uh, in those four years, I was assigned as the uh, school resource coordinator for Guilford County Schools over all the school resource officers. I graduated uh, from Guilford County School System as well as my, my kids and my grandkids. Uh, one goes to Pleasure Garden uh, Elementary Schools in second grade. I didn't come here to represent any parents or any certain groups. I really came here to represent the 70,000 students that really don't have a voice. They don't have a voice uh, until after the shot's fired. And so at Guilford County Schools is not prepared uh, for what we've seen nationwide over really a series of years. We started Columbine, we've had Sandy Hook, Parkland, now we have uh, UVAL. And we, we tend to lose a value in the lessons taught in these arrest, horrific carnage that happens. We lose it after a few months, we lose the effect of it. We lose what it really means to us, what we need to be doing as a body. I don't wanna see a podium out front of Gilbert County Schools saying that we're, going to, we're learning from our mistakes. Because right now with our past, they're not mistakes, they're failures to plan. They're, they're inactions, they're not mistakes. The board should work unified, not apart. We the citizens elect all of you to oversee the largest budget of Gilbert County funds, oversee policies, make directives. This includes policies and directives to keep our children safe. You share a huge responsibility in the safety of our children. You have a school safety director. You have finances and the capability of putting together a team to address immediate needs. And it changes in environmental safety design and technologies to make and begin to make a safer Guilford County Schools. This is your time to shine as leaders for our children's safety right now. Don't let your future actions fail our students in the safety. Thank you, school board members, Dr. Contreras, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our public speaking for this evening. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Move the, mo Second. Move the agenda. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Did Anita say aye? Deborah. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. We are now at the consent agenda, Dr. Contreras. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, members of the community. This evening's consent agenda includes the approval of the May meetings minutes, the personnel report, 2021-22 budget amendment, transfers report, employee mileage reimbursement rate, and the contractual agreement with AAR of North Carolina Inc. for roof replacement project at Oakview Elementary School. That concludes this evening's consent agenda for Move your consent consideration. Agenda. I second. All right, um, Diane? Yes. Linda? Yes. Uh, Winston? Yes. Kim? Yes. Betty? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Anita? Anita? Yes. And Dina? Yes. yes. Thank you. That passes by a vote of eight to zero. Uh, yep, eight to zero. So two empty seats there. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, could I just ask on that uh, item E, 
um, which is the roof replacement. Um, where, where are those funds coming from? Item E is a contractual agreement with AAR of North Carolina Incorporated for roof replacement project at Oakview Elementary School. Welcome, Ms. Those Reed. are coming out of our typical capital funds that we have every year. So that has nothing to do with the bond or no. anything? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now at reports from the chair. Uh, good evening and welcome. Congratulations to the more five more than 5,300 students who graduated from Guilford County Schools in May and June. We are so proud of these students and we look forward to seeing what they can accomplish in the future. Be sure to check out our graduation website to learn more about them and see all of our graduation ceremonies on YouTube. I want to thank the voters for their support of the May 17th bond referendum, which passed by more than 60% of the vote. It is gratifying to see what our community can do when we work together for the greater good. This is a historic milestone in our district's history, and I'm very proud to be part of that. Congratulations to uh, two Guilford County schools that were recognized for their prom uh, promising practices by character.org. Sumner Elementary and Allen J. Middle were two of only three schools in North Carolina to receive this honor. These schools demonstrate activities <clears throat> and principles that help cultivate a culture of character in the school. They will be recognized at the organization's national forum in October. Summer is here, and that means that summer meal distribution has begun. 22 schools are open for breakfast and lunch Monday through Thursday of each week to serve children under 18 years old. A full list of schools can be found on our website. Now is also the time to register your child for kindergarten. Parents of children who will be five years old before the end of August are encouraged to register at gcsnc.schoolment.net. Early registration helps our schools plan for staffing needs in the fall, so please don't delay. School will begin uh, sending information to parents in July and August, so make sure your child is registered. Congratulations to Guilford County Schools educators who were honored by the Guilford County Council of PTAs last week. Among them are Grimsley High Principal Jed O'Donnell, who received the Outstanding High School Administrator Award, Allison Snyder of Southwest Elementary, who received the Outstanding Elementary Administrator Award, Southwest and Grimsley also had the outstanding high school and elementary educators, Natasha Wolf of Southwest Elementary and Stacy Way of Grimsley High. Um, just a reminder, please note that the date for our second meeting in June has changed. We will now meet on Tuesday, June 28th in this room. As part of our superintendent search, we are seeking feedback from the community on characteristics that you would like to see in a new superintendent. You can find the survey at www.gcsnc.com under the Board of Education page. Please complete the survey before July the 8th. We welcome your feedback. And before I conclude, we have some special guests from the Learn to Swim program who wish to bring uh, remarks. Please come forward to the podium. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Susan Brayman, and I am the uh, former emeritus, I should say, uh, Aquatic Center Director. And uh, my colleagues with me tonight are David Hoover, the manager, and Rachel Krause, who is the coordinator of our joint partnership for the Aquatic Center and Guilford County Schools Second Grade Learn to Swim program. And it's my great honor and privilege to be here tonight because we're here to honor and thank Dr. Contreras. When we opened the Greensboro Aquatic Center in 2012, we started a pilot program. We had four schools that were very close to the Aquatic Center. At that time, in the first year, we had 257 second graders that participated and learned, uh, participated in our Learn to Swim and Water Safety program. It was challenging to get those students during the school day, but we did it and we did it the next year and the next year and it began to grow. And under Dr. Contreras' great leadership on this and her tremendous support with this program, we were able to continue to grow to where this year we hosted 35 elementary, Guilford County Elementary School wow. second grade classes and hosted 1,962 second graders who graduated through Learn to Swim and Water Safety.
Drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death in young children and an estimated 65% of Hispanic and near 70% of African American children do not know how to swim. But together with your support, we're lowering that statistics by teaching these lessons during the school day. We're ensuring that every second grader has the chance to participate in this. We're not only helping to save lives, but to change lives. And it, we also need to recognize that this time it's our privilege to also recognize Ms. Bellamy Small, who at the time that the Aquatic Center was a vision, was a great supporter as a member of our uh, Greensboro Council and uh, voted in favor of it. But not only that, she's been at countless years of in the water as a volunteer to support the program. And, and beyond that, she has uh, supported by helping the growth of the program by getting additional funding from the city of High Point and other community leaders um, that we rely on to, to run this at no charge. Um, and I wanna share with you our commitment, and this is made in our community by so many people uh, beyond the three of us that are here tonight. And that includes the uh, Greensboro Coliseum, the Greensboro Community Foundation, the Greensboro Sports Council, um, this is our commitment. We will continue toward our goal of providing all Guilford County elementary school second graders with this valuable Learn to Swim program. We will continue to secure privately financed grants and sponsorships, and ultimately, through the Matt Brown Learn to Swim Endowment Fund, which was established in 2017, we will financially be able to sustain the second grade curriculum driven program for many, many years to come. And in closing, we want to um, give a little memento to Dr. Contreras and tell us how much we sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. Hold on just a minute. I think board member Bellamy Small would like to say something. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to thank y'all for uh, being able to be here. And if if those of you who've heard me talk about this, the, the, the Learn to Swim program is probably one of the things that um, when I'm dead and gone, I'll be able to say, well, Lord, I did get one thing right. Um, this staff, particularly Susan, because, uh, you know, it takes strong people to uh, do a program. And, you know, Susan and I, I'm on, I was on one side, she was on the other side, and we had to learn how to uh, communicate and come together. But our interest and desire was to try to help as many children as possible uh, learn to swim. And the creativeness of the program, and Dr. Contreras, when you came on board, and uh, we're willing to come out to the Aquatic Center and see what else we needed to do to make sure that our children uh, have that opportunity. Uh, Susan, uh, you know, we both know what the thrill was. We, we saw these little babies, eight years old, and when the first time they came to the Aquatic Center, they looked at that pool and said, mm -mm, not getting in there. <laughs> and between the, the training of staff and the encouragement, by the time we would get to the last day, we couldn't get them out. And that has not changed over the 10 years that we've been in this program. I still suit up uh, and, and, and come and, and try to, I'm, I'm kind of the enforcer. So, so the kids look at me and they go, who is that? And I said, I'm your worst nightmare if you don't do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but our point was, in all the time, Susan, tell me if I'm right, we've never had an incident We've never had even, I don't think, a, a close, and we would take the kids over into the 18 feet with their uh, life jackets on uh, and put them in. And I, I can never say enough to thank you guys and to thank Dr. Contreras because we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be moving forward as fast as we are 
in this program as far as the number of schools that get added each year and and you have uh, schools calling and asking now yeah. well, when can when can we when can we get get there we still need volunteers we still need teachers because as we expand the program we we still got to have people to come and 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 be there to be you know uh, a part of helping us uh, you know help these kids so our first class um would have graduated this year i think because they would have been second graders 10 years ago so our first class graduated yeah. and we hope that some of those kids uh decide to do some things in aquatics whether it's be a lifeguard or or find other interests uh in that so thank you very much for for coming thank and you. dr Contreras. i've wanted you to see these sunflowers before you left so uh, so so thank you very much thank you appreciate it and thank you before you leave we just want everyone to know um, that the board is considering a policy that they'll be voting on uh, during the next board meeting that memorializes this program and mandates that all second grade students will participate uh, unless their parents opt out of the program. Uh, and that is a really big deal for the district. Um, we value swimming, we know this data, and I just want to thank um, Mrs. Bellamy Small. This is not a Sharon Contreras achievement, but uh, she shared the data. She introduced me to the program and the data made sense. And then our board chair, some of you may remember, explained the history of why so many black and brown children cannot swim in this country. And that simply made sense to me. And since that time, the, poli the board's policy committee said, uh, we have to do something about this. And they've created a policy that we're voting on. So this community together is doing something about uh, the just horrific number of children who die each year uh, because they do not have access to pools or uh, knowledge of swimming. So thank you so much for what you do every day. Thank you for that. And that's that's the best news I've had all day. <laughs> but I have to tell you, too, that we're, we're not only leaders in this, we're role models in the country. And the people that contact me and say, how do you do this? How, how did you get approval to get these students during the school day? That's the question, you know? And I don't know how to explain to them about what we have in the leadership, but I tell them it's here and we'll share everything we've done with you, you know? But um, kudos to you guys for being on the front end of that. Send me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. That is wonderful. Um, we are now at um, the superintendent's reports. Thank you. Good evening again. I was so honored to be part of the graduation ceremonies for the class of 2022. This outstanding group of students earned more than $166 million in scholarships and grant offers and will head to prestigious schools such as UNCG, High Point University, North Carolina, A&T State University, Harvard University, Brown University, Yale University, MIT, Princeton University, the United States Military Academy at West Point, and the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. I had the privilege to speak to and meet the valedictorians and salutatorians and their families at a special luncheon last week, and I was so impressed with their accomplishments and goals, and I was equally impressed with their parents. I expect that many of them will go on to become CEOs and entrepreneurs, scientists, humanitarians, and of course, teachers. Some may thrive in fields that are still developing. Regardless, I know we will see great things from them as they continue their educational journey. Summer learning started today, and there's still time to register for our fun and free summer camps. Camps are available for all ages and interests, including new career and technical education camps such as robotics, Minecraft and coding, money matters, video game design, sports marketing, fashion design, culinary arts, and cybersecurity. Register online at www.gcsnc.com. GCS is also pleased to announce the 10 semifinalists for next year's Teacher of the Year. 
the winner will be announced at our Celebration of Excellence event this fall. The semi-finalists are Sarmilla Day from the Penn Griffin School for the Arts, Kenneth Butler at Guilford E. Learning University Prep, Olivia Gerald, Grimsley High School, Juana Rahili from Guilford Elementary, Katie Kinderman at Southeast Middle, Cynthia Warren, Colfax Elementary, Holly Herberg, Ferndale Middle, Nina Sumter, Weaver Academy, Christopher Carroll at Sternberger Elementary, and April Donovan from the Middle College at UNCG. We congratulate all the semifinalists. Also, congratulations to the newly elected officers of the Guilford County Council of PTAs. They are President Michelle Thigpen, First Vice President Keith G. Pemberton, Second Vice President Rhonda Daniels, Treasurer Andrew Lofters, and Secretary Julie Kimsey. Please note that our district will be closed on Monday, June 20th in honor of the Juneteenth holiday. We will also be closed the week of July 4th through 8th in honor of Independence Day. Next week, 11 and 12 month employees will begin operating on the summer schedule, meaning that they will work 10 hours a day, Monday through Thursday, and the offices will not be open on Fridays. These modified hours have saved the districts hundreds of thousands of dollars in energy costs over the years. Finally, I'd like to echo Chairperson Hayes' comments regarding the passing of the $1.7 billion bond last month. I am thrilled to know that the new buildings and improvements our, to our existing buildings, uh, which are so desperately needed, will begin to take shape in the coming weeks, months, and years. Future generations of students will be able to learn in modern, safe, healthy, technology-ready buildings because of the efforts of this community and for that, I am truly grateful to each of you. This concludes my remarks, and my staff does have three reports this evening for the board. Good evening. We'll get started um, with the consolidation of virtual academy recommendation. This will go as a public hearing on the June 28th and an action item on the 28th. So this is um, providing information leading up to that discussion. Sarah Clicker. Thank you. Ooh. No. There we go. Okay. Um, so just as a reminder, we had, let's I'll go back to the beginning here. There we go. We did launch the two virtual schools um, at the 2020 academic school year start to provide parents more options during the pandemic. Um, we launched two separate schools, one K-5 and one 6 eight. Um, the K-5 school, Guilford E-Learning Virtual Academy, is housed at Hunter Elementary School, and Guilford E-Learning University Prep is housed at Jackson Middle School. Enrollment for the K-5 um, Virtual Academy decreased from 2,506 students in 2021 to only 656 students um, in the current, well, the school year that just ended 21-22. And the table below outlines that by grade and race. So you can see um, the, the breakdown there. This shows that um, in a different way, just the difference in enrollment from the 2021 school year to the 21-22 school year. The enrollment trends by grade level you'll see decrease the most at the entry level grade. So kindergarten and first grade saw bigger decreases in enrollment. Enrollment for the 6-8 university prep decreased from 1,511 students in 2021 to 539 students in 21-22. And that table um, shows the same enrollment trend broken down by race and by grade. You can see that graphically here for 6th, 7th, and 8th. And again, the 6th grade saw the biggest decline in enrollment. 
The total enrollment in virtual programs has declined by 70%. We see the same trend in other virtual schools across the nation that opened in response to COVID-19, and the highest drops were again in the entry grades of both schools. Again, um, we have been engaging staff and family around what the consolidation of that looks like. We have Johnson Street, for example, is another K-8 school. So that's what that's, this would look like if we consolidated the K-5 and the 6-8 academies. And again, the public hearing and board action will take place in two weeks at the already scheduled um, board meeting. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Kim? Uh, yeah, I would like to know um, what happens to the reallocation of teachers when this happens? The same thing that happens on the 20th day of school. So, you know, we have projections about where kids will enroll and where they'll show up. And then we look at that at the 20th day and reallocate as um, as it shows when the students are actually in seats. And but we would do that earlier in this case. Isn't that right, Dr. Morrison? Yes. When we close schools, we know in advance and we give them the opportunity to select other schools. Okay. Right, we wouldn't, it's the same process, not on the same day. We wouldn't wait till into the school year. We would wait until the board took action. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The other question I had, can you speak to the fact that why it's not K through 12? Because we do get a lot of questions about why don't we have this for high school level. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, because of the access that we have to online courses and we are able to offer online courses, we always um, encourage when face-to-face -face is an option that that be the first choice. We know students perform better in most cases in the face-to-face -face setting, but we do offer core courses, AP courses, more than 350 courses in the virtual space, and they are also in North Carolina is the North Carolina Virtual Public School that many high school student, high school age students um, take advantage of. That already existed in our comprehensive high schools, and so it felt duplicative to have a separate standalone online course option for our ninth through 12th graders and my last question has to do with is this an opportunity for like say if there's a growing interest is there an opportunity to reopen or expand it again or if there will be no need to like we won't require to have separate schools again we would just grow this k through eight model correct right. correct Thank Other you. questions? Diane. Okay, you said that the uh, largest decline was in the K first grade? It was in the entry level, so fewer kindergartners enrolled in 21, 22 than 2021 and sixth grade. Okay, well, I mean, when you say fewer, is it, will you get to a point, or do you think, you know, let me ask it a different way, um, how many students would you have to have to continue a, uh, a, a kindergarten virtual? Usually 16, 14, 16 students would make up like the bare minimum of a class. So we would just have to look at how many are interested. Okay, can you go back? What? How many do you, did you have this year? I think we had two classes. We got down to two classes this year. So 30, 32? Mm -hmm. 36, 36, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you, I know you can't see the future necessarily, but do you think that that you might not have the kindergarten uh, level? Because if, if, if children need to, I, I assume that there are kids who do their whole school life virtually is that correct there is i think what you're asking i mean if we didn't have enough students enrolled to warrant allocating a teacher we would look at it on a case-by-case -case basis for the student for example some students who are five who are very medically fragile need a homebound option okay. all right so i guess the answer to my question is that you probably would not eliminate uh the the kindergarten unless you got just unless it wasn't enough to warrant a teacher allocation. Okay, all right, thank mm -hmm. you. All right, I don't see any other questions unless Anita has a question. And I meant to say earlier that Pat Tillman can't be with us. He's uh, um, called away on military duty, so we thank him for his service. 
Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, we are now at an update on school safety, a pilot of body scanners, or, or let's see, yes. Good afternoon. Hope everyone's doing well today. We're going to talk about Guilford County and schools and the touchless security screening process that we're looking to bring in as a pilot program. I want to start by really taking us back to the conversation we had in November and where the current climate is. And the most important thing for me on this conversation today is talking about the balance between schools and hardening to keeping our schools safe because there is a it's, it's more of an art than a science, um, quite frankly. And I think that uh, you've all read a number of articles on both of, the, both of these ideas, and we'll move through them fairly quickly. These are the trends as we gave them to you in November. They haven't changed. They have st uh, remained steady. The homicide rates in Guilford County have continued to remain higher than they were over the last three years. And our five-year averages in each of the jurisdictions are higher now than they were five years ago. With this, this is, you'll see this slide here. It's the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. You have not, this is all stuff you've seen before. So it's just, a, like I said, this is a reminder of what we're looking at. But we have had larger gun and active shooter and non-active shooter threats in schools in this last year than ever before. We also talked about this research here, which is 43% of shooters were students, followed by individuals with no relation to school at 19%. This is school shooter data that's been collected since 1970. 53% of all incidents occur outdoors, including parking lots beside buildings in front of schools and athletic fields. 21% of shooting incidents occur in parking lots, followed by incidents in classrooms at 11%. This Last one, 37% of incidents involved escalation of a dispute followed by accidental shooting at 11% and suicide attempts at 8%. There's one stat that did not include up here, but I want to bring to everyone's attention again. We've talked about it numerous times, and that is 84% of all school shootings occur in high school. <coughs> school violence is focused in <coughs> high school at about 84%, 15% in middle schools, and 1% in elementary schools. So that's important to keep in mind as well as we go through this. RM sales estimates, um, if you follow the news lately, they've actually increased for 2021. The latest data that's been um, published formally was for 2020. As you can see, that's rising and it has continued to rise. This is the main statement about this is that there are more guns available and our jurisdictions are also reporting more guns are being stolen at this point. Greensboro police had more guns stolen out of vehicles last year than ever before. North Carolina firearm cell estimates, as you can see, it follows a national trend. This is important too, because this kind of gets me started. I could look at this a little bit different than some, I believe, but when I look at this in the hate group actual numbers, if people read the news and record over the weekend, you'll see that there was a there is a quite a spike in hate groups in the, across the United States. And where this worries me is it gets us back to the heart of what many of our issues are, which are the mental health issues. Again, this is a focused conversation today about screening and security screeners, as opposed to being about mental health. But this is a point where it's my first opportunity to talk to you that today is still the number one safety piece is the relationships in our schools, the relationships between our children and a trusted adult. That is by far what is going to keep our schools safe. But there are other things that we can do and other things that we can continue to look at and improve upon. 
I think each of y'all have read the, these, both of these articles. They were provided for you before. This is just a reminder. These are some key points that, again, we discussed. School shooting incidents have increased in the United States by 54% in 2021. School shooters showed observable mental health issues before carrying out the attack. Although, as a society, we might not be great at recognizing those, and that's a whole other piece that we can get into on another day. Research also indicates school attackers communicated their intent to others. And if you look at there, you very clearly see what that is. They observed an observable planning, actively sought help to address bullying, and expressed experiencing severe depression, sadness, or isolation. The majority of school attackers had at least one identifiable factor in their life, such as domestic violence and abuse, financial uh, family difficulties, parental divorce separation, and family mental health issues. I'm gonna skip ahead. And I'm gonna skip ahead to the key point, and it's what I started off with, and that is school districts must balance physical security improvements of schools without compromising the principles and values around learning. Right now, I can tell you right now, the best secure building I could give you is if you gave me a cinder block box with one entry point and no windows. I can make that secure and our students can be secure in that building. My question to you is, will they learn and will you as parents accept them being in that environment? Because I wouldn't as a parent and I don't as a parent. We need facilities that are also here to do the number one thing that Guilford County Schools is for is educating our children. And so we have to find the balance. Touchless security screening is part of that balance, in my opinion. I'll get into the evolved technology here in just a second. Touchless security screening is not a metal detector. That's the first thing that we need to get across. Because if you remember in November, we also talked to you about some of the negatives around metal detectors. This, I'm gonna go through the pieces of it that will show that what we're worried about with the mental health issues related to students and going through a mental detector and the lines and staffing issues that it takes to run metal detectors in a school are answered by this solution, this screening solution. This is. I'll let you take a look at it here when, when we're, while we're reading. 10%, 10 times faster screening than a metal detector. So a metal detector, we said in November, takes 30 to 45 seconds to actually get a child through. A child walks through this at the rate of their normal walk. They don't take their bags off. They don't empty their pockets because this has the ability to determine the difference between weapons and ordinary daily actions such as keys, computers, that type of thing. Yes. <laughs> Again, that allows us not to have to worry about lines, extreme long lines outside of schools. It allows us not to have to worry about children because what happens in long lines as we discussed before is children often become more nervous because they're recognizing wait, we're here for guns, guns could happen, it almost can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The next piece on that is when you have children at the beginning or the end of the day, you want to keep them moving to and from the school rather than congregating in large numbers. That's another security risk. Staffing, as opposed to your staffing of a metal detector where you have to have hardened locations with specially trained security members, these staffing can be done by two staff members in the school. It also offers us the ability to have flexible deployment options at each of the high schools that we've looked at. There would be the ability to move this uh, to athletic locations if the principals determined that screening for athletics was also important. Again, this is much a little bit more detail on the same piece. One of the things, the way this works, and I'm going to show you how it, how it works. So if we look at the previous slide, you'll notice there's a tablet down in the very bottom. That tablet is what you're looking at as the screening is going on if you're the person running that. 
So what it does is a postal metal detector where it goes off and it beeps, and then you have to pull the person aside and run them over a secondary scanner. This actually highlights exactly where that threat would be by putting on the tablet and the picture, putting a polygon over the, the threat location. So if there's something that it identifies as a possible we weapon, it will show where that is. How many of y'all remember in April walking through a different set of scanners that were out here? When, when you did that, did anyone really notice much about it until after the meeting? It's because it's very seamless and very quick moving. So said we can fit 3,600 kids and people, not just kids, but anyone visiting the school through this scanning system in one hour. None of our schools are quite that large and they're all gonna have multiple entrances. So that's even a, a better show that it should be able to not affect our entry time for students at all. I'm gonna show you this video real quick, which is just a school right down the road in South Carolina. And that's the beginning of the day. It's a short video. <laughs> That's, that's how it works, normal speed. A lot of y'all will uh, recognize these from the Charlotte Panthers games if you've been to a Charlotte Panthers game recently and a few other amusement parks use them as well. So this week we're gonna bring two of the Express Evolve scanners up and we're going to start a pilot, uh, piloting them at High Point Central and Smith High Schools. They'll come in this week, we'll install them, and then Tuesday, when we come back from holiday, we will start utilizing them. Um, students and parents and teachers will be receiving information about the process in the next few days through Connect Eds and other, and the, the typical communications packets that we put together. Um, this is for the community. I'd love to invite everyone, including y'all, to come out on June 22nd from four to six to Smith High School or June 23rd from four to six to High Point Central High School and see how they work. Walk through them and, and experience what will be going on at those two schools during summer school. So that's a quick presentation. It's down and dirty and so try to go through quickly. But any questions? Yeah, before you uh, do the questions, just to make sure that the uh, public understands that we know that having there are only i believe three other districts in the country that have this technology right now and up to six now six now and that body scanners may seem a bit frightening and that's one of the reasons when we put the rfp out um, we also asked for um, one of the body scanners to be brought to the board meeting to see if anyone would even notice that you were walking through. So I don't know if you even remember walking through that uh, last April, uh, uh, this past April. We also are going to ask the public to weigh in on this before we actually move forward with leasing these. I, I don't think we can buy those. We have to lease them uh, for school in the fall. Um, beginning with the secondary schools uh, using our ESSER funds. And there will be a survey um, that uh, anyone who comes out through on June 22nd or June 23rd and walks through will be able to complete the survey to let us know what their experience is and how they feel. Uh, so the board uh, has some information from the community uh, before moving forward with this. But this has been some time in the making. This is not a response to the latest um, school shooting. Um, in fact, this is not something that would prevent a mass shooting of uh, 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 that sort. And if you could just speak to that a little certainly, bit. <laughs> certainly. So um, it's really hard to talk about an emotional subject with figures and logic. And so let me start with that to begin with. Um, elementary school violence, it, it's hard to put into words um, what that does to each of us. And I don't think any of us would be in here if it didn't upset us greatly. Unfortunately, this scanner system is for high volumes of people to come into school. And it's really directed at schools where the threats are from internal, which is what the evidence shows for high, high schools. 
for our mass shootings in elementary schools that have occurred in our nation, this would not have prevented them because in each case, the person did not go through the door, did not go through an area where there was a chance to lock down. The reality was that each of those large scale incidents happened through someone breaking through a barrier in two cases and someone in a, I've read the initial report on Uvalde and it shows that it confirms what everyone has heard that the door was propped open. And so unsecured doors are the other end. So this does not solve every security problem. And I think that's important. This goes back to the balance. And our balance is, and, and I'll say this all day, every day, the number one thing that we can do for school safety is create strong relationships within our schools. So one of the things about this is that staff man this machine as well. So staff are still making the first contact with children in the morning. This does not replace the one card, this is an addition. So this will still create, and, and this is coming from the original Sandy Hook promises, it starts with hello. Correct? And I think that we're all in, I think that's an accepted practice across the nation, and it's one that I believe in. So it still will start with the relationships. This is one more layer that will help us in securing a location that we believe we can secure better. And that's that's the bottom line on this one for me. But this would find a hidden weapon, for it example. Absolutely, yes, it would. And so what it is, and, and again, I know that we don't have all day long for this, and so I don't want to belabor the point, but what this does is it looks for shapes, sizes, and densities of what make up handguns, rifles, and project, projectile items. So that's what it looks for. And it has that um, capability. Thank you. Uh, we have Diane, then Kim, then Betty. Linda. I don't know if you can give this number, but how many weapons did we confiscate this so year? We confiscated, we confiscated six well, we confiscated five handguns, and we had a report of a sixth handgun on campus, but we did not confiscate that. We did not find that gun. Okay, but didn't you have other weapons like, or you don't consider BB guns or So, so no, we, we do or... not consider the BB guns, but I can tell you that we um, confiscated 12 BB guns and had BB guns involved in three other incidents where they were not confiscated. So a total of 15 BB guns. And then there were numerous incidents with... Um, issues ranging from pocket knife brought onto campus or a larger kitchen knife. And most of those did not show any intent to utilize as a threat. Okay. Um, on page five, I think you, know, you, t you talked about um, the uh, parking lots uh, or, okay. And I don't, there is not a way to protect our students and staff if they're going to the buses or getting off the buses, is there? So, so there is not a hardened way to do that, but there are ways and that number one ways, and I'm sure that a high school principal like several of the ones that we have in the room in here could tell you more about the way staffing and is utilized in that. But the number one way to protect in that is having teachers on workstations during the end of the, sh the, end of the day. And there isn't a high school or a, a elementary or a middle school that I've been to this year that hasn't had that. And so that is the adults are out there to make sure that things don't happen or don't break out. Is it fully preventive? No, but it is, it is, it is another set of eyes and adults in strong position. Is that another layer of training that the staff is given sometime during yeah. the school year or during so, the so summer? This year, the principals were really good at bringing up at least one item around school safety for every in every month at least one piece every month and we're going to ask that that continue in their math monthly staff meetings this year okay um if i recall um when we instituted the one card was that not also a way for us to uh, provide some form of safety as far as knowing who a is in the absolutely and, and it still is and that's why we will not be getting rid of one card with this but that is that is one again that's one more layer of knowing who is in the building and when they're there okay may I ask how effective has it been so right now in high schools we're looking at about a 68 percent rate in elementary schools it's higher it's about 81 to 82 percent overall we have some schools that are as high as 96 and 98 percent 
rate of I checking in, yeah, the effect of, of, of bringing their IDs in. So a number of times IDs are not brought in and they're given passes for the day. And so that is still one thing that we're still working on. When we talked about this, if you'll remember, we did say that this is a culture change. And I think it's very important to point out that culture change and that with all of the ID systems that have been put in schools and Dr. Contreras has put it into school before, prior to ours, um, they say that three to four years is when you get that culture change. And so we knew this going into this being our first year, that it would not be a perfect scenario and we hope to improve it next year. Okay. Um, can we ask how much the system will cost, e even if you're renting it? So we are um, currently involved in our uh, RFP process. We are doing selections now. We have not finalized our se uh, selection process at this time. Estimate. So we're waiting, we're getting bids from all of our vendors that we're uh, in the RFP process for. Okay, what is, is there a range? Yeah. It's per unit, yeah. There's a range of about. So, so what it will be is for, each, for all of our high schools, it'll be somewhere between 750000 to a million dollars a year for scanners. Per school? No, no. for all for of the high schools. All, all, all yeah. for all. <laughs> For all, for all 19, oh. for all nine, 19 non-public, separate, or middle college, early college, high schools. Okay. And this is not a question, but I, I made the statement before, and I think you would agree, is that we are strong as our weakest link. So if, if, if staff does not practice the kinds of things that they can do to keep uh, the kids or to control who's coming in and out of the building, then, you know. You're right. I do agree. That's absolutely true. We're, we're only as good as we practice and only as good as our weakest link at each school. And so that is true. I would add that there's an interesting article in the Washington Post that points out, and all of us who have been principals know that, um, and I sent all of you the article today, that um, what happens is, is an adult comes to the door, there is not a building that I couldn't knock on the door and get a student to open that door for mm -hmm. me. It requires a cultural change. Um, the other thing I think the board could consider in consultation with legal counsel, um, we often think of students when we think of these um, weapons cases, but I think there is, uh, reason to consider um, perhaps a policy that if you have some sort of domestic violence situation or a situation where you have a, um, what is it called? Domestic violence protective order. Yes, yes, that you must tell someone in human resources or the principal so the SROs know because we've had situations with weapons, several of them that had nothing to do with students but it had to do with the adults. Mm -hmm. And um, we, if we had only known, we would have been looking for the principal, the front office staff would have been looking for that. So I think there may be room for a policy surrounding that. And that is probably in elementary schools, that's probably the number one call that myself and Mr. Trent get is responsive domestic between either parents of a child that's attending or between a boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife of an employee. And that's probably the number one call that we get to come help and assist with. So. Thank you. Um, Kim, then Betty, then Linda. Uh, yeah, I definitely have to agree that is definitely a culture change from working in ACES. It, I had to train the children not to go to the door, even though they recognize sometimes it's their parent and mm -hmm. even you know, and training them, and, and parents would actually get a little angry because they're like, you left me standing. I said, well, they, I have to keep your child safe. And no, they cannot just keep running to the door to let you in. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely a culture change and understanding those safety parameters and putting those things in place. Um, I wanted to know whether or not it's car rider line and then bus rider doors. So, like so it, it, doors. Depends, it depends upon each school because yeah. um, y'all have all been to our schools. And there's as many varieties of the way our schools are made as there are kids that go to the school, it seems. And so um, every school will be a little bit different. But this is, this is the one time where COVID has actually helped us 
and that we have narrowed our entrances into our schools already in order to monitor for the different things that we were monitoring during COVID. And most schools kept those reduced number of locations open as the entry points for our schools. So in most schools, if I'm giving a general piece, it's normally a car rider, walker entry, and a bus entry right. in, in most schools, but it's a little different at, at each high school. In our high schools, the complexity goes, it, ex it changes as we get more drivers at different schools. That brings in a whole other detail that we've had to take into consideration. But looking at the schools, we do have a, we feel like we have a very comprehensive plan to, to move forward. I don't want to get too no. much in the weeds on that, though. And will teachers be going through? Yes. Staff, everyone, everyone is going through. Yes. It's as not they as in isolated. The they, right. they will, teachers will have the ability to come in before those are manned. So the reality is that's going to be up to the individual principal to work at. But our, our problems across the nation have not been with teachers. Um, they have, that's, that's not been our, our number one. That hasn't even, that's not even a, a high percentage, not even a low percentage point of violence in schools uh, when it comes to gun violence in schools. Yeah, I totally understand that. But I'm just thinking when I'm a high school kid, it's like, well, we have to do it. Why aren't the adults doing it too? That's all yes. I'm thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? Sorry. We're saying that mainly happens in our high schools, the shootings on the parking lot and different things. However, we have seen mm -hmm. it happening in our elementary school. Yes. Okay. And we have talked about the mental health issue. So this, like you said, will not help that situation. And we still have a lot of parents that are out there that are very nervous about what's going on. And it is going to be that extremely rare, rare situation, mm -hmm. but no one ever wants to see that happen. Absolutely. So my question is, what do we do? I would like to see what we're doing about the mental health. I've seen that we're, we're hiring a bunch of uh, social workers, yes. but what, because violence in our schools is mm -hmm. up, okay? So what is the mental health? Are we, what are, are we reviewing our mental health procedures are we reviewing how are we you know people want to know how we're addressing it so so let me hit two things and then um very quickly one is so this came about as a fact that we are always con we're constantly right. looking at new policies new procedures new technology right. out there I got um director debori is doing the same thing in the mental health side he is constantly looking at what is working and what are best practices so i will throw that out there first i know that he's working at it on his angle too, but that is not within my purview, so I don't wanna to speak to what he's looking at. What I do wanna talk about is the um, elementary schools <laughs> right. and, and that one piece, and that is, if you'll remember, that in the $353 million within the $1.7 billion bond are security upgrades, and one of those upgrades are vestibules for our schools. Mm -hmm. So two things, for, for our elementary schools that do not have existing vestibules. So two things that will help us. One is, back to your point, Ms. Diane Bellamy Small, and that is that we have to practice and make sure we keep our doors locked and that we do that. Number two is that vestibule piece, we need to make that hardened and make that a place where we can stop an intruder before they get past that. And that is in the plans for each of our elementary schools. And all of our currently planned bond schools have that built in and i think that's very important to point out because that because you're right they're very rare but you saw I, I got a little choked up to even thinking about elementary school so so i don't ever want to be the one who has to deliver that news right. so i agree with you so i want to do something about that right um well i had entry entry you know doors yes. and mm -hmm. that would, would you address that that and cameras. I mean, yes. I'm hearing all the time that a lot of our cameras do not so, work. We have old technology. What are we doing about so that? So the RFQ <laughs> process is, has taken the piece, and RFP process has taken the piece of joining all three of the security measures together in that bundle of money to see how much money we have. We now know what that is. We are finishing up our RFPs on the cameras as we speak. We have our meetings, our first meetings with the vendors are next week, mm -hmm. and we will limit okay. those vendors, and then we'll move forward. Well, we have outdoor 
I mean, I think, do we have yes, cameras on the outside? As some schools you do, and that's an individual. I don't want to get into okay. the actual I'm, locations I'm of where those you. are. Um, and, and right, I think we will share with the public that, again, though, that exactly. we have $18 million <laughs> allocated in ESSER funds, as the board knows, for yes. cameras and security, mm -hmm. other security measures. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Mrs. Wellborn and any board member, if you'd like some of the details, please contact Mr. Ritchie. We don't want to discuss where the location of all the security uh, technology is in open session. And, th and that's fine. And then I have one more thing that I would want. When this happens, and God knows we don't want it to happen, teachers are defenseless. Are, there are tools that can help them barricade themselves in their classrooms. Yes. There are tools that maybe they can put up, like some kind of metal sheathing that can be used as a magnet board or something. Right. But in that one incidence that they can put in a corner, bring their children around. I know we don't want to have that, but, and you may know, it's kind of like having a generator and hoping you never have to use it, it okay? It is. So, you know, are we looking at blockades for doors? Um, some kind of, you know, you, you're talking bullets. Yeah, so, so I think- So I'm just saying I'd like to know. Yes. Because parents want to know. We, we've got to focus on this. Absolutely, so similar to uh, what Mike alluded to as far as the designs that we're doing for our new schools include some of those safety measures that we've thought about. But I think any specific Material well, I'm not equipment. For yeah, I'm just saying that we are we are actively making sure that our designs have those included, and Mike's team is evaluating other safety measures that we have that may be coming up that we don't even know about. We're learning new things as we're going through this process, especially with our safety and security and our SEPTEP experts mm -hmm. that are allowing us to say what we can and cannot do, what's actually effective, what is not, what's new technology out there that we should be thinking about for our elementary, middle, and high schools that we could use. Um, so that that's kind of where we are with that um, well, equipment. Well, you know, I'm just saying we, we need to have the Teachers so with, need tools. With the article that Dr. Contreras sent, I read yeah. it this morning, um, it talks about the fact that there's a burgeoning security industry that mm -hmm. is almost, um, I think the quote in the paper was, it's security theater. Yes. And so there's all sorts of things that are out there. And so, yes, we are talking with experts in that field. And more importantly, we brought maintenance in. And this is why, because doors are their domain mm -hmm. and they understand how they work. And so we're bringing in not just security experts, but guys who know how to operate all the pieces. In some places, it's very simple as putting something to cover the lock and keeping the door locked all the time. Mm -hmm. And that happens in a number of our schools. Some, some schools have different doors that we're looking at that we're probably going to have to add something to one day or, you know, as we go along. But we are absolutely exploring. And one of the things that I want to tell you all again and reiterate is that with new technology, we are looking at it constantly. Yes. We're looking at new ways to secure things, and we're looking at best practices. On some things, we're able to be cutting edge, such as this pilot program. We'll be the second school system in North Carolina to, to be looking at them, and that Charlotte is, is the primary. They were the first to look at it, we're the second. So we're cutting edge in this end. Um, and some, we wanna sit back and make sure, is that a working piece or is that just theater? And so one of the things we have to do is constantly evaluate. But my promise to you is that we will constantly evaluate. Yeah. And so I appreciate that. Winston, then Deborah. Thank you. I appreciate um, the constant work and vigilance that you all do. And, and I know we see messages about things that are averted all the time that don't make the news. Um, so I do have some questions they may not be able to be answered tonight, so it may be follow-up that's required. And overarching, I'm just wondering about a more, and I know you all are in touch with your colleagues in other silos in the community, in the Sheriff's Department, and the Police Department, but there may be a reason that we need to convene across um, sector group that's looking at reducing violence in our community because you can see the data that there's violence rising in the community and people are going school's got to do something about it and you're like well <laughs> there's sort of an onslaught or you're operating in an environment and so we've got to uh, um, attack this or ameliorate this from a community perspective with others um, and so I don't know what that looks like but I think it's something for us to think about as a body and the other bodies that are governing those institutions um, 
some of the data I was interested in, you probably don't have it today, but I would be interested in when we talk about um, instances of school shootings, um, are there trends at all in terms of the age of the perpetrators or the victims? You know, and, and the other was around, um, even as we see community violence rising, we talk about, there was one of the slides about firearm sales and community violence, and are we seeing trends or changes in the ages? Like, are younger people buying more guns? Or, so maybe some deeper data, and that might be something that as we're looking at it from a community perspective, we would ask for and be looking at. So, but. so on that, the offenders of, of right now, the offenders in Guilford County, specifically Greensboro, High Point, Guilford County, the offenders are slightly younger than they've been in the past. Mm -hmm. We are looking at a, a younger average age. We are looking at mainly teenage offenders in um, shootings. Generally in, in, in general violence, so that, not yeah. in, not within schools, but in, in violence. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers in, in um, school violence have been fairly consistent over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. which is elementary school violence is typically perpetrated by adults mm -hmm. who come in. Middle school violence is typically perpetrated by middle schoolers and high point and high school by high schoolers. Um, and of that high school age, those are your, your, your primary um, age groups. But and when it comes to community violence right now, guns are being stolen at a higher rate in our community okay. out of yeah. cars and primarily unlocked cars. So I'll mm -hmm. do a public service announcement out that lock your cars, please, no matter where you live. Um, and then, um, and so those guns, and those activities are typically done by 14 to 16 year olds in breaking into cars in in Greensboro and High Point. So the more guns available generally in the community, the more they're being stolen. Yes. And then utilized. Um, so I was just interested in how some of that also sort of hate groups. Is there any tracking or data around the age of people joining hate groups or tracking with hate groups? And I know that can be complex data. It, so it is I don't the, know if the there's best. studies you guys have seen or might share as you come Southern, across them the southern coalition for justice does a great job of collecting that and if you go to their website which what did you um say? southern oh, coalition yeah and so that that would be who i would recommend that you look at and we typically look at their articles on a regular basis um i'm also you know when we look at over 50 percent of these shootings right as i maybe i've got the data I'm wrong or or more than that, aren't what we saw in Uvalde. Um, over 50% were, you know, from disputes, they were outside of schools, they're all, you know. So if we were gonna spend a million dollars a year on, on that large number, what would we be spending that on? And that, you know, that may be some of what you all are bringing back to us. And you're saying in the community, as opposed to in the school? Well, no, I was, I was looking at the numbers on the school shootings I guess it's on slide five, you know, where yes. we're like 37% involved the escalation of a dispute. Right. And, um, and with that, I would say followed that... Followed by accidents at 11 and suicide at eight. Like, so that's 40, what am I doing? 48, you know, 56% right. of the shootings in schools are those kind. Right. So if we were going to spend a million dollars a year to try and attack that problem, how would we spend it? So... With the scanners is, is really what I'm here for tonight. So I'm not trying to avoid the question. Right. No, I'm it's gonna okay. Come, yeah. I'm going to come back to that. Okay. But with I'm the good. scanners, what I would say, and, and again, this security screeners is the, the, the more appropriate term I would uh, uh, keep going to. I've just had a bad habit of using the same word. So um, with the screeners, I would say that is a good investment for most of those that have happened inside schools. And the reality is, is that what happens is they will be, the kids will be funneled in towards those and then go out to classrooms and from there. And there'll be a method that, again, I don't want to get into in open session of how to be able to track that from one right. building to another and that type of thing that has been considered. So um, that is a good start. But on my end, and this is, this is I'm speaking from my experience of uh, through the police department and through here, I would gladly like to see more money put towards mental health in our community mm -hmm. and mental health response in our community. And that is going to be what is going to have to happen for us to, to, to fight this as a culture is to attack it from a mental health perspective in large ways and to really look at finding the help that, that we need as a society to get through this onslaught. 
um, because that's 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 the number one issue here. What we're doing is attacking a symptom. We are not attacking the problem with this. But this symptom needs to be addressed the same way a fever needs to be addressed in when you have the flu. Right. Yeah, because I mean, if a significant portion of the violence in schools is related to domestic abuse, right? That's that's a mental health issue. It's also a response issue. Like, how are the police department and the sheriff's department responding when they get called for those disputes? And how are they walking away or not walking away? And then that turns into a school shooting later. So how is coordination of response? What's their responsibility in mitigating that violence before it happens as opposed to saying, well, we did our part and then somebody showed up at school and shot people. I mean, there's a lot of pieces there that aren't even just mental health that can there, have to do with response is, and training in other agencies. There is, but I'll tell you that most of that is around mental health as well. Mm -hmm. And so you'll notice that each of the three agencies that we partner with have created mental health units where they have non-law enforcement responders going to address this very issue. So mm -hmm. there have been some very good first steps taken in in our county and so we can support that but i do think that is a conversation for a, a larger a larger group and it's one that i know that uh miss hayes and dr Contreras both brought up at our last call of community leaders about three weeks ago i believe it was four weeks ago yes it was during the middle school graduate middle college graduation and, and so i think that 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 is a great start and i think each of these agencies and Guilford county have started we we need to push it forward so thank you. Thank you very much. And just thank you to our principals and all the leads and buildings, custodians and teachers who are front lines on this every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Deborah, then Anita. And as far as addressing the mental health issues in our schools, I would like to point out that we have at least gotten a foot in the door with the social emotional learning aspect. I know that there are people out there that disagree with it, but I sat through all four of the individual parent training sessions. I also sat with my youngest when she went through pre-K and they started singing little songs about, hello, how are you? How do you feel today? I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm not so good. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I'm out and having fun. It's as simple at that age, nothing but putting a name on what you're feeling all the way up to middle school where they start to talk about, okay, well now we know the names for the emotions that you're feeling, so let's discover where they're coming from. And then you get to high school and it's like, well, you've got the name and you've got the origin, so now, you know, what are your coping mechanisms? And they start to at least engage in the dialogue of how do you feel? What makes you feel that way? And what can we do about that? And addressing those three key discussions when it comes to over emotion and mental health have been proven to be problem solving for a, as a blanket statement just about anyone who can put a name on what they're feeling if we can hand them how to help deal with it maybe one day we can get to the point where we don't have people who shoot each other over the last piece of chicken in the bucket thank you anita um, 53% of the incidents occur outdoors. Yes. Give me some examples, not specifics, of what we are doing to um, lessen that number. So certainly. So one of the things that uh, your your staff, building staff, and I thank you all for, for pointing out the principals and, and leads for this because they're amazing at this. Again, they set up work plans for teachers and teachers that they, they signed on to teach and most of them step forward and really help out in, in so many other ways beyond just teaching and one of that is to have adults in areas where congregate where kids congregate and keep those kids moving and keep them going on and keeping an eye on the kids again it's building that relationship so i i can think of i've got a couple of high schools that i don't really mention but i've got a couple of high schools in mind that i'm watching as the kids progress in my head, right? And they, they're crossing the, the parking lots and the teachers there are saying good morning to them, saying, okay, remember, go in this door, go in that door so we get you taken care of. And they keep them moving along. And that is very subtle, but that is usually the majority of what it takes is that simple hello, that simple paying attention. They've got a radio out there and if they see something bad, they call it in. And that's, that is the first step of security because we only have one security, uh, one um, SRO per high school. And those SROs tend to stay in per each, at each high school. And they tend to stay in centralized locations so they can get to anywhere at the school quickly. And that is a, that's a good response for them. And so they can go outside. A lot of your high school SROs 
actually start their day outside in between that parking lot and in that walk-in. They don't start the same day, same place everywhere because they don't want to be predictable, but they do start uh, often in that outside piece. Um, and again, not being specific, but in some of our schools, the first scanners, the first screeners will actually be in an outside position. We have at least one school where the, the, the best way to bring kids in is to start scanning outside in a, in a covered hallway and bringing people in where you actually have a vision of the majority of the way kids come in. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we, I, I do wanna say that um, Dr. Contreras, um, Chief Deputy, Richie, which I think it's so beneficial because of um, the decades that you've had in law enforcement and then the time that you've spent in our schools being able to, um, you know, have um, the, the, the insight and the perspective and the experience and seeing what's going on, I think is incredibly beneficial to this district. So we're really lucky to have you uh, and your, your background. Um, but you were with us on a call as Dr. Contreras um, invited the um, chair and vice chair of the county commission, uh, the sheriff, um, representatives from Greensboro Police Department and High Point Police Department to begin a work group uh, because we know that this is not a single system problem. And that um, if we look back and as you continue to inform us that all of the things that are that lead up to this, there's usually some point where somebody knew something or didn't know they knew something that maybe we could have captured. And so it is going to take a cross systems effort to provide the community and school safety. I think I heard uh, Dr. Contreras say in that call that we made at the Coliseum, uh, it was that urgent and that important that day um, to say that, um, that when the shooting happened in Buffalo at a grocery store, this is not a grocery store problem. When it happens in New York or another city in a subway, this is not a subway problem. And when it happens in schools, it's not a school problem. Um, and we have to approach it um, in a, um, you know, sort of wider um, uh, approach than, than just looking at what we can do inside of this building. Um, because I, I know that after Sandy Hook, and I was uh, looking back at some of the things that we've done, and it might be helpful to just compile all the, th the things that we were doing, but through the Guilford Parent Academy, we're doing Sandy Hook Promise trainings back in 2018. Dr. Contreras said um, that we have continued those things. And so all along the way, we are learning everything we can that I believe all school districts are struggling and trying to figure this out from what we can do in our facilities to the training of our staff, to the work that we're doing with our students, to our relationships with our public safety experts, to our broader community. It is just gonna take that type of coordination. So, um, you know, I, I know that we are all committed and that safety is a, is a number one priority um, in this district. We don't see safety apart from learning. We don't see learning apart from safety. And so um, thank you so much and um, for, the, for the presentation. And um, Dr. Contreras, if there's anything else before yes, we Yes, I, I too, as I'm leaving the district, just want to thank um, Chief Ritchie for um, joining the district. Um, we know he had many options, uh, but he uh, has a daughter here in the district and um, he really supports and always has uh, the, the school system, our principals, teachers, and most importantly, the students, and has just added so much expertise and value and support to the schools. And I know he will continue to do so. Um, with respect to Mrs. Wellborn's question on mental health, there's so much focus on this. In fact, this morning, I was on a call of the executive board of the North Carolina Superintendents Association and the state, I believe, and um, please don't quote me on this, but they have a division, I think, of health and human services, but they've added um, extra an extra office um, that focuses on mental health support for schools. And there are a million, tens of millions of dollars they intend to provide to schools, but they have so many vacancies. And you may recall from our last presentation that individuals aren't even going into these fields anymore. We're having difficulty getting people to go in to, to become mental health clinicians. Um, I know there's a mental health technician pathway in uh, career technical education that we're working with Cone Health on, but still with such a 
that's a long-term strategy that won't help us today. And over the last 10 to 15 years, the mental health system has been decimated in North Carolina. And now we desperately need this um, sort of support. Uh, last week, Rutgers University School of Public Health came out with a study specifically about black teenagers that said on average, either personally or, t or tangentially, uh, black teens face on average five incidents of racism or racial discrimination a day, and it's inducing or increasing depressive symptoms. And yet we're at a time where we also don't want to talk about race in school, so it's difficult to deal with that as well. And when I ask the question about, so how are we dealing with trauma from that, there wasn't a good answer uh, for how we're going to deal with different types of trauma. So they're all uh, different types of trauma, but specifically for students who are dealing with something as significant as facing five different incidents, or on average five incidents of racial discrimination a day or racism a day, uh, and then uh, feeling depression because of that, it seems like we should be addressing that more directly as well. So there's just, it's such a massive problem. It's a gun problem. It's a mental health problem. It's a domestic violence problem. It's a poverty problem. It's a racism problem. It's a structural racism problem. There's just so many issues we have to address as a community, and schools cannot do this alone. Uh, we have to do this together if we want our children, our educators, our support staff, um, our community to be safe. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of ongoing work. And as we said, this is just one more tool. I think um, Linda said that's just one more tool. This won't do it alone, but it will help us find uh, some weapons that we didn't know were coming into the building. Uh, we'll have some support with that, but it's this alone will not stop a mass shooting that's going to take the work of the entire community, state, and country. So again, thank you for your report tonight. Thank you. Uh, we are now at the career and, <laughs> career and Technical Education uh, CTE Career Pathways Update. And I asked Dr. Chillis to present to the board because uh, there have been several community mem uh, meetings I've been in where there's been concern about whether or not we are uh, preparing students adequately for the workforce or not a clear understanding on all of the career pathways that are offered in the district. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that every opportunity we have that the board understands what's being offered, what will be offered as we rebuild and renovate schools, uh, what that timeline is, where we've made some modifications uh, for your consideration uh, as we consider growth uh, in uh, the workforce and in jobs across the nation. Uh, and also, uh, just to solicit your input on where we might uh, present uh, these uh, updates to the community because uh, most people don't watch the board meetings, but we certainly need to be out in the community so that they understand the work the district is doing, not just for our students, but you also know you approved through the ESSER budget dual generation programs, and we're working with the workforce community, workforce development community, the chambers of commerce on supporting our parents and families as well. So I'd like to uh, just turn this over to our chief innovation officer, Dr. Chilla. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Contreras, of course, our GCS staff and community, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. We'll be talking about career and technical education and more so really thinking about how every single graduate has an opportunity for employment, enrollment, and enlistment. So of course it begins with the CTEY. We've calibrated ourselves around this elevator speech. It is in your lookbook. 
Um, this is semi an interactive presentation. So where you feel like you may have questions, this lookbook will be very handy. In addition, in your folder, you have a few CTE accomplishments, just a little over 30, but wanted you to be able to look at some of the things that we've been able to do within the last two years. So CTE is about ensuring that our students are prepared for those high skill, high wage, and in-demand careers. This starts as early as pre-K with career inspiration onto awareness in elementary, exploration in middle, and then of course high school preparation. We want to make sure that our students are prepared for post-secondary success and that includes immediate employment with industry credentials in hand that allows them to start in a position not at the entry level. When we think about CTE as a whole and where we are, we're everywhere. We're in every middle school, high school, and beyond. When we look at our numbers, we have 19 high schools where about 13,000 students are present taking a CTE course. That's 59% of our students um, participating in CTE. At middle school, it's 72%, with over 1,100 students in CTE courses. That's a 1.14% increase from the previous year. We have over 50 CTE pathways. We took two years to really create precise CTE pathway sequences. They directly align with the 16 national career clusters. In North Carolina, and that means in GCS, we offer 15 of the 16. Which cluster don't we offer? It's government and public administration. Middle school, I mentioned already that it's career exploration. So when you look at some of the programming from business to computer science to family and commuter, computer science to STEM, even um, to app development, which is coding with SWIFT, you'll see how that aligns to some of the high school career clusters. So it's not a direct alignment, but we have the opportunity to make it a very direct alignment. You see how students matriculate through the courses in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade as well. I mentioned before that we have career awareness in elementary school. This year, for the first year, we had elementary schools who joined a pilot where we wanted our elementary school students to get certified in Microsoft Office Specialists, meaning our students at the elementary school also walking away with credentials. So they have an opportunity to have a Microsoft credential in Word or PowerPoint. Our high school pathways I mentioned are 50 plus. Um, if you're wondering where those pathways are, again, in your folder, you can see where all the high school courses are located by site and where all the middle school program is located by site. So you'll see under a cluster, which is in your lighter blue, you'll see in the dark blue some of the pathways. And those pathways, some did not exist two years ago. Some have been strengthened so that they are more precise, and some of them are new to the district. When we look at our concentrators, those are students who are pathway completers. A pathway completer is a student who has taken at least two courses under a precise pathway sequence. Once the student completes a pathway, they've concentrated, we count that number. For the 2021 school year, 34% of our students were concentrators. Our strategic goal says that by 2022, we'd have 35% of our students being concentrators. We expect to exceed that number. In 2020 we had about 3,000 students attaining industry-recognized credentials. Excited to share, that's a 48% in increase from last year with over 6,700 of our students obtaining an industry-recognized credential. And what we did is we looked at those in industry-recognized credentials that had the highest, uh, most prestigious, and most significant impact in the workforce. In GAP, the Guilford Apprenticeship Partners Program, we have 250 stu 215 students who have participated, and 75% have been accepted into the 2022-2023 cohort. When we think of GAP Apprenticeship, it aligns to the work of our Blue Ribbon Task Force. It aligns to the work um, of labor, um, labor, emerging labor markets. That's in the field of IT and healthcare and automotive, automotive and HVAC, including logistics. Excited to share that this year, for the first time, we'll have about 125 students, high school students, who will intern in over 20 business and industries, and they're earning $15 per hour. And we're excited for our students to have that opportunity. At the same time, 30 of our teachers will participate in teacher externships. It's important that our teachers get into industry, that they understand what the trends are and that they're able to implement them back into the classroom. 
three specialty schools, three early middle colleges, as well as you'll see CTE as well. When we look at CCP, our career and college promise program where students are taking um, advantage of and leveraging dual enrollment, obtaining college credit, and doing this debt-free. We have over 1,800 courses taken, over 1,800 college credits obtained, and when you think about the tuition savings, that's a 1.47 um, $1.4 in tuition savings. Why CTE matters, I know that you've heard this before, but I did want you to see it visually. We talked about how C pre CTE starts at pre-K and goes all the way through high school, but 65% of all careers in CTE and skilled trades fall under that CTE umbrella. So our students are being prepared for the workforce, for certain competencies, and connecting that to their academic excellence as well. Nationally, over 1.5 million high school students are enrolled in CTE courses. Um, this statistic of 95% of students graduate, which is 10% above the national graduation average, is great until you look at 99% of the students in Guilford County graduate at 99%. So we're very proud of that, that our students in CTE uh, graduate. We know that for every one CTE class, um, compared to every two academic classes, it minimizes a student dropping out. So visually, what does this look like and why does CTE matter? Again, when we think about public school, on the left side, you have traditional education. What happens in the classroom, you gain knowledge and that becomes um, your basis and then you have two options. You go to college, you pursue your two-year degree or your four-year degree. But on the right side, we're disrupting that thought. We're thinking about non-traditional education. Our students not only having knowledge development skills, but work-based learning skills and the opportunity for CTE to truly be the bridge between education and industry. What does it look like? Quite different. Several routes for students to have an opportunity to be prepared not only for the workforce, but for college, an entrepreneurial venture, or military pursuit. Under each of those paths, you see that students are walking away with credentials, certificates, licensures, or degrees. More importantly, we know what this looks like. Um, Andrea Smith from Bank of America states it just firmly for us. Two of every three new jobs now require some form of post-secondary education, whether it's training credentials, an associate's degree, a four-year degree, or higher. This reality really underscores how critical education is to career growth and how important it is to increasing economic mobility. So it leads us to more work in GCS, and this is where I just want to highlight our signature career academies. True disruption in traditional classroom design. When we think about Instagram, it's the most valuable photo company. They sell not one camera. When you think about Uber, it's the world's largest taxi company, and they own not one vehicle. When you think about Netflix, it's the largest growing television network that lays absolutely no cable. And when you think about GCS, we have the most innovative, we are the most innovative school district, and we have no traditional classrooms. So when we think about this, okay, all right, okay. So when we think about as we start to go forward in some of these slides and we're rethinking what CTE schools look like and we're rethinking the workforce and how we prepare our students, parents, and guardians, and I heard a lot tonight, the community, um, I think we're cutting edge. So we start with you know, our five signature career academies. You all know about those five signature career academies and the reason why we had to look at new collar jobs and a focus on advanced manufacturing and computer and information sciences, transportation, distribution, logistics, all the way to biotechnology, really aligning to the regional and state economic development needs. We know our Blue Ribbon Task Force and many of you on the board had input in that. We know that you had opportunities to really think about, well, what are the growing spec uh, sectors and have an opportunity to make sure that these spaces really do represent um, the need in industry. You know that they are state of the art. And so that leads us to where we are. We are ending year three, going into year four, with 500, approximately 553 students enrolled. Our goal was 600. Remember, this was the first year that Dr. Contreras offered transportation to all of the Signature Career Academy, so we really started to see those numbers um, start to go up amongst our school sites. 
And looking at our Signature Career Academies, and I just pulled these out because I did want to highlight those. Um, our students, they are obtaining industry-recognized credentials, of course, in the counseling and mental health, pharmacy technician, and bio research pathways. It's 141 credentials that they've obtained. Ben L. Smith High School, they will obtain a certified lab review associate developer credential that is to be determined because it is new for them. And we're excited because it aligns with workforce needs. When you look at Kearns Academy of Computer and Information Sciences, you have several CompTIA. And just think about that because you'll hear it again. But CompTIA certifications where students have obtained five. At Northeast High School, same, because they are two of the same uh, Signature Career Academy types, five students obtained there. And then lastly will be Western um, Guilford High School, where we have our drone technology, global, log global logistics and supply chain. And for some of these, specifically, is a to be determined because we are waiting for those students to get certified. There have been conversation um, around Western not having sites where students can fly outdoors. However, there are spaces where they can fly, and um, our current pilot is also looking to see if any restrictions can be um, rethought so that our students are able to fly in that area. And then last would be, um, did I get Western? Oh, I got Western. All right, so now I'm going to master's facilities and thinking about the direct alignment with not um, just how CTE um, is considered, but how our master's facilities planning and CTE went hand in hand. We really thought and thought deeply about the type of program that we would put into these um, spaces, not just for today, but for tomorrow, and making sure that there was effective alignment with high quality CTE programs in the labor market. And you've heard me say that already, but then collaboration, strong collaboration with the business industry, post-secondary, secondary community as well, and then meaningful accountability of really improving not only the academic outcomes, but technical outcomes as well. We talked about for the non-traditional approach for students, being able to pursue immediate employment, the two-year, the four-year degree, or the entrepreneurial venture, the military pursuit, we had to start rethinking some of the ways in which um, we prepare students and what those matrix look like. And then last, of course, the innovation. And this is supported by the systemic reform of our federal and state policies as a whole. So we'll get into the current master facilities plan and you'll see that there's some slight variation in some of the programming, but I'll talk about it more in the next slide. So if you wanna go ahead in your presentation, you can, um, but I just wanted to show what we currently have talked about or had posted for um, y several years now around master's facilities. So you'll see Andrews has a slight change as an innovation um, center. You will see a change around Jackson and Swan, Kearns and Wellburn, again, Ben L. Smith, and then you'll also see our uh, Aeronautics High School as well. What does this look like and why are we um, talking about it? When you think about CTE programming and us having that specialized training in your flip book, you have these precise pathway offerings, being able to have these CTE sites strategically planned or placed throughout the district aligns us to, allows us to really think about our students being prepared for these high skill high wage occupations. We'll talk about in some few slides coming um, forward, our parents and guardians being prepared as well. So Andrews, think of it as an innovation center with specialized CTE programming. Jackson as a 612 Academy of Sports and Entertainment. Swan Center being a 612 Early College of Coding and Artificial Intelligence. You'll see it's two, one would be for all boys, one would be all girls. And then Wellburn and Kern 612 would be Gaming and Design Innovation and Artificial Intelligence and Aeronautics um, High School. And you'll see why we chose Aeronautics versus just saying Aviation. And then Ben L. Smith as an Innovation Center. So it looks like you have a CTE high school with certain specializations, and this is just a look at what some of the pathways may be. These would be pathways that are existing, pathways that are emerging or don't yet exist, and we create it. 
So at, under the Andrews Aviation Center, you specialize in public safety and health sciences and pathways may include fire and emergency services with a specialization in smoke jumpers. I know Dr. Contreras has the statistic of how many people are not smoke jumpers and why we want to concentrate there. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it is important and it's a specialization under fire and emergency services. Of course, health information technology is important as well. When you look at Jackson's 612 Academy of Sports and Entertainment, you see its specialization, but think of those pathways, turf graphs management, esports, sports and video broadcasting, even exercise physiology. Our Swan Center, don't ask me why I have the two, one, I'm just- One moment, yes. this, the Jackson 612 Academy of Sports and Entertainment mm -hmm. would require um, that the board revote on the facilities mm -hmm. um, plan because initially this was a second Allen J. Prep East, but based yes. on student interest um, and where we thought, um, what we hear from students about what they want to go into, mm -hmm. we would maintain Allen J. in High Point, uh, which was the plan to expand it, 612, and change Jackson um, from 612 Allen J East to Jackson 612 Academy of Sports and Entertainment, specializing in those areas mm -hmm. uh, because we talk to our students often and also look at where the job growth is. And we wanted to have more career pathways. So this is the, you see some different wording, but the rest are the same. Mm -hmm. The only change is at Jackson. Thank you. Uh, the double emphasis for the Swan Center um, is just two colleges of coding and artificial intelligence. You see the specialization there, and then some of the programming, as I mentioned before, existing or emerging, like your cloud computing and your avatar design. Wellburn Kern 612 Innovation Center, you see the specialization um, listed just two pathways there, gaming and avatar design and artificial intelligence. The uh, Aeronautics High School specialization is aviation, aeronautics, and sports, uh, sports, space exploration. So some of those pathways would include avionics, air traffic management, space operations and exploration, and then of course, um, aviation business administration as well. And then lastly, Ben L. Smith Innovation Center. You can see some of the specializations there. Based on specializations, you have programs like heavy um, and diesel equipment technology, mechatronics, integrated machining, um, advanced manufacturing, which currently exists, and then again, the cloud computing, and then some of your more con question. Yes. <laughs> I need it. OK. You can finish you sure? up, Jill. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was on the roll. All right, and then you have some of your traditional CTE paths, construction. And when I say traditional, just thinking of construction, but under construction specialties like carpentry, electrical, and welding. All right. Um, expanding and building the workforce in Guilford County, Dr. Contreras mentioned the dual generation workforce, that's development training. This is utilizing some of our most specialized CTE labs, some that we just talked about today, and of course under the umbrella of our signature career academies, a time to really train and certify our parents and guardians in the same high skill, high wage, in-demand career paths. We know that this will help reduce the racial wealth gap. It also allows us to partner with CompTIA. I mentioned before, I told you our students who are obtaining the credentials, the parent or guardian uh, obtaining the same credential, are you sitting at home or in the park or wherever to study, is pretty impressive. So we're excited about that. And that partnership is with NC Works. It, going on even further and thinking about the workforce and how we do the work is the Guilford County Community Education Center. This education center um, has been inspired by the Richland II Institute of Innovation. Many board members attended as well, so we were inspired of how we could have our own community in education center that really allow for, in, as an inter inter internet hub, training and development, of course, credentialing, employment services, and then overall general impact as well. When we think about about the work of my future NC and the state of North Carolina having 2 million people certified by 2030, we are directly impacting that number. 
You all might be very close to thank you. All right, so before questions, um, I do want to leave you very inspired. Uh, you have visited many of the Signature Career Academies, but I don't know if you visited all. So when we talk about just some of the master facilities plans and where we're going and just visualizing the greatness, um, I'm going to play this video and then we'll end with questions. When I first saw everything here, I got excited. There was nothing like this in this school before. And the way they remodeled everything, all the stuff that they put in here for us, it made me feel like I can't wait to get my hands on this. By far, technology jobs are the fastest growing, highest paying positions available in the United States. And is the areas that we have the most unfulfilled job openings. So CT is really important to starting those kids off on the right path to be able to fill those jobs. Education is evolving. As the world evolves, education should also evolve with it. And the workplace environment is changing. So we need to allow those industries to partner with school systems so that we can cultivate what is currently present so that the students can matriculate in a better fashion. We work really hard talking to our partner companies, and we have more than 40 of them that work with us, as well as the colleges and universities, to make sure that we have the right kind of equipment and the right kind of curriculum. We have partnered with Guilford County Schools to provide trainers for their global logistics program and career technical education. The industry really loves those certifications. When a student comes out of those certifications, they're going to come out with a job. I think a traditional high school setting puts them in a position where uh, it's a normal classroom setting, all the students facing forward. This provides them the opportunity to do some critical thinking in the classroom with other classmates in a project learning environment. This classroom also helps them to transition into a career after high school or college because it gives them real world experience where they can actually touch and feel some of the operations that they would experience should they go into this career field. As you see, the spaces really reflect industry. They simulate a real world experience from the type of equipment, from the type of workstations, from the coloring, the lighting, uh, even the floor design. The spaces allow students to have ownership of the space, ownership of their learning, and more importantly, choices for careers and not just graduation. Life and lessons are the best teachers, right? Everything doesn't come from a book. Um, but we have high quality educators here, um, teachers that have actually been in the industries that are teaching our kids. So when you couple that with a flexible and innovative space like our pharmacy technology lab, with our mental health space, kids are really immersed from day one into these programs. There's no hypothetical situation for learning. We're learning what's you know more efficient for our company, packaging our goods in a flat pack or fully assembled package. It's a very exciting and new field that provides a great opportunity for students. What you learn and what you gain is, is more than just uh, cyber security or artificial intelligence because technology is the future of, the, of this planet and we're the future generations that are going to dictate what happens to our environments ourselves, our societies, our governments, and much more. So it's really important to understand the basis of these things so we can make more educated decisions later in life. The renovated spaces reimagine the classroom and create pathways for students to become career conscious in high skill, high wage, in demand fields. So when you walk into these spaces, you will see industry replicated. We will continue to create innovative learning environments for our students every day in every way in Guilford County Schools. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So questions. Uh, Anita, then Kim, then Diane. Okay, on page 22, 22. Um, there are 14 um, CTE programs or schools that you've listed, but we're only addressing seven because I'm counting the two at Swan. So what's the status of the other seven? So um, thank you for asking that question. I had 70 slides today. 
And the superintendent asked me to um, give us more time for planning um, because we did have a lot of information that we wanted to include. I just wanted to pull out some of the work that we're doing now. Okay, and then one more comment in, in your video that yes. you just showed. All of those were in existing buildings, is that correct? Yes. There were no new buildings involved in those? No. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Kim and then Diane. Uh, yeah, thank you um, for that presentation. It's very exciting to see um, these things. Even if we've seen them before, it's still exciting to keep seeing it over and over, I think. Um, my question is that when students are taking these classes, some of the um, CTE classes, do they overlap for qualifications for their regular high school diploma? like requ requirements like do any overlap mm -hmm. into the science requirement or a math requirement or any of no. those things happening no because they're electives <sighs> yeah okay we don't want them to be though so thank you for bringing that up <laughs> i don't know i'm more for <laughs> fast track get me out of here kind of stuff mm -hmm. so if i'm taking a cte class and it's going to qualify to meet a regular high school requirement mm -hmm. You know, I, I want that. That's just me. Um, and how does CTE, these initiatives, impact what we're doing on the elementary school level? Because it sounds like it's a lot of reading. It's, a not, it's these yeah. other skills yeah. that students are going to need. So are we changing what we're doing, like even in the elementary schools, to meet the needs of being able to do more yeah. in middle school and high school? So we recognize that coding is part of literacy. It's a language. And so when we think about K-12 coding across the curriculum, that's one thing that we're doing. Specifically, though, in CTE, what the state has created is something called a career awareness survey. So it's given at the elementary school level, and it gives some exposure around career and technical education. What we've done in the last two years is really thought about how do we now credential students? And so I mentioned before how we started this pilot with our elementary school students having an opportunity to obtain the Microsoft Office Specialist. These are just ways for us to kind of rethink what's a ceiling and not for our kids. Right now, the Microsoft Office Specialist uh, cert certification or industry recognized credential is offered at the high school level. We believe that our students can obtain that at the elementary and middle school level and they can start obtaining more credentials in coding and programming, computer science, and artificial intelligence. My other biggest concern is that, you know, we have a lot of this programming happening at our traditional high schools. And what I see is that we have uh, still the, some kids are not accessing some of these programs. So I want to know, are we thinking about the kids that are automatically attending a Western and Smith and making sure that those kids are accessing these programs simply because it, those programs are housed mm -hmm. at their schools and we have a lot of kids coming out of zone and attending no school. So I just want to know what are we thinking about as far as access because then we keep creating these inequities right in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. So remember, Andrews and Smith will become full CTE choice schools. That's what you voted on. So for the other schools, they recruit from inter internally, and then they recruit externally across the district. OK, but are we guaranteeing any type of home room? rule for the kids that are automatically either zoned for these schools you know it do you understand what i'm saying i do so mm -hmm. remember andrews and smith those zones are the zones where the parents don't uh, for the most part want their students or access the most choice they choose their own schools the least amount of time so you made all schools in the future, once the, the schools are rebuilt, all schools in each of those zones become choice schools so that they can choose from any of them. They don't have to, they, there's not a neighborhood school in the Smith zone or in the Andrews zone. They choose where they want to attend in those zones. Okay. I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm just still a little worried about 
are kids that don't want to go anywhere else, right? I want my school, and I'm... Then they would, they would get in. They would get in still. Mm -hmm. Right, because they are in that zone. I know so what you if mean. they want um, to focus on mechatronics, then they choose Ben L. Smith. If they want um, turf management, turf grass management, then they choose Jackson. If they want artificial intelligence, they choose the early co the A and T four early college at the Swan Center. So everyone will have a pathway. Even if I decide I only want liberal arts, but I still want my home school, and I will still be able to access those things. In those two zones, they don't have a home school. They have multiple schools to choose from. They can go to any of them because they want choice the most. They're the parents who said, we don't want any of these schools as the home school so they get widespread choice they can go to any of the schools in their zone or they get to choose one of the district-wide magnets okay one more question mm -hmm. scenario i leave guilford county i go to a charter school i want to come back where do i go do you live in the Smith if zone? If I live in the Smith zone, you go I'm to still going to be able Smith, to access all of that. Any Smith school zone you choose. Wow. Okay. Uh, Diane? You know, when we um, invest in good leadership, we get good results. And so, Dr. Contreras, um, you know, you've invested in your staff being good leadership. I mean, the enthusiasm of this uh, young woman <laughs> would make me want, no, I wouldn't want to go back to high school, but uh, <laughs> almost. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, my son went out to Western Guilford, and uh, he's in his 30s now, and he said if Guilford County Schools had been offering the kinds of things he saw out there then, mm -hmm. he might have uh, behaved better in high school. <laughs> but uh, he was very excited because he said, you know, this is phenomenal compared to what he experienced. Uh, he would have been a 2004 graduate. So, um, you know, kudos from a young person. My first uh, question has to do with uh, page seven about the GAP program. Uh, as you know, uh, I've been somewhat uh, actively involved with that. And one of my concerns had always been is the, ex the access of our students to getting to these uh, um, uh, to these apprenticeships. Um, is, has that improved? Uh, I know that I, I, one of the things I was told is that once we got more companies involved, involved that were like in Greensboro or in High Point, that we could see more of our kids perhaps participating. Is that happening now? It has. So we've, we've seen increases not only in the enrollment in GCS schools, but also in what the demographics look like. So we have 51% non-white in GAP and 19% female. So that is definitely a change and an increase from the last two years. Okay. But it's still a barrier. But it's still, it's a yes. a huge barrier, yeah. and that cannot be resolved by mm -hmm. the district. So it's the same workforce barrier mm -hmm. that the adults face. Mm -hmm. And the county and the cities must address the transportation issues throughout the county in order for more students to participate, because we should see many more students mm -hmm. in apprenticeships right now. OK, well, maybe we need to have a, a conversation with our uh, city managers or local government, particularly about the transportation, yeah. because that's been one of you know, the issues in High Point in particular uh, with their mass transit mm -hmm. system, which you know, stops at 6 o'clock. So people can't uh, continue to, to get back and forth to work. And so that would not only be an improvement for our students, but it would also be an improvement for their parents or for mm -hmm. the adults, because they can't get back and forth to work either because of that. Um, my next question has to do with, uh, and I think you addressed this, are we matching <clears throat> what Guilford County's workforce needs are or will be? Because 
I know that Guilford County, Hyde, Greensboro, the Triad area is trying its best to pull in more uh, businesses, if you will. I mean, the mega site right now is probably one of the big things on everybody's mind, but are we tapped in to meet the workforce needs? I mean, it's great if our kids wind up going all over the world, but yeah. what we're trying to do is improve the quality of life <clears throat> and uh, um, the kinds of, of quality of life to stay home if they want to. So the quick answer is yes. And on the 28th, I would love to share more about this alignment with some of the local business and industries as well, um, aligned to those top sectors that we mentioned. Okay. Then my next. Just um, Mrs. Bellamy Small, you may recall the way the facilities master plan was designed was through the Blue Ribbon uh, Task Force on Career Technical Education, which helped us revamp all of the CTE pathways. So we didn't just choose this based on student interests. We actually worked with Brent Christensen and Patrick Chapin out of High Point, who co-chaired the committee and helped us with um, other technical assistance partners to determine where the jobs were going to be in Guilford County, in North Carolina, and across the country, and to help us align our programming to those jobs. Okay. Okay, my next question has to do with, uh, and this is more of a can question, can businesses uh, do specific funding um, so that if you have a, a company that is interested in a specific um, uh, one, one of our pathways or one of our uh, CTE programs and wanted to sp direct monies to that, could they? Yes. So yes, we have companies that do that now. They sponsor um, students on field trips or they sponsor students for um, competitions and career and technical um, student organizations or in the upfit of, of spaces or donation of equipment and things like that. So that's a hard yes. Okay. And then my next question is, do are we connected to a national network um, so that as we develop, uh, as we develop our children, that they are not limited just to Guilford <coughs> County. And I don't want anybody to say that I don't want them here, but are we connected to a network that shows what we're doing with young people so that if, say, a, a company out of uh, Washington State said, hey, do you know Guilford County is training uh, students in this particular area? Let's, let's go after them, let's recruit them. Is, is, do, are we connected in any way like that? That's a yes. Okay, all right, next yes. question. Um, I saw that you said you had for Jackson uh, sports um, related things. Mm -hmm. Where was aquatics? You are less than uh, it's an under, eighth of a mile. It's under sports management. Okay, you're less than an eighth of a mile from a uh, uh, aquatic center that I would think we might be able to have the kids spend some time there. And I didn't see aquatics. So, I, I mean, that would be a golden opportunity to figure out a partnership where those kids get to actually spend some time because you have a, um, a deep well where they could learn how to do underwater diving in, you have, which is 18 feet, you have, and then you have the nine feet and the seven foot uh, pools. So um, I was just one, and also the, you have a therapeutic pool. Mm -hmm. So under sports management, mm -hmm. you have a pool where they could actually do training for, and there's some, some equipment that's already there, but I, I just, since you're so close, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two more questions, I'll be through. Uh, Dudley, um, I, I, how do we, one, one of the, a few years ago there was a, um, I think they did after school, but Dudley had a race team. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, they were, you know, they took the kids to, uh, I think a national competition, but the teacher who was doing it, he was primarily doing it after school as a part of that. I, I, I want, is Dudley in this mix anywhere? They are. They still have an early college for engineering okay. and an early college for education. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just want, you know, I just want, because one of the things that you showed us what, at one point was where when you looked at um, the AP offerings that Dudley was like at the very, very bottom uh, as far as what it had to offer as far as AP courses. 
but I didn't want them to get left out of this as far as, you know, what those kids could do. I know you said that a child could go, I assume if they lived in Dudley area, but wanted to go to Smith, they could. Could you say that last part again? If a student lived in, in the Dudley district, but wanted to go to Smith, could they? Yes, because Smith will be, Smith and Andrews will be district-wide CTE schools. Okay. okay. All right, and then my last question is to do with transportation. Um, will we be in a position to provide the level of transportation? Because if I recall, one of our most expensive uh, transportation items has to do with uh, providing transportation for our uh, choice schools. Is that not correct? It is a problem, um, and it continues to be a problem, but we are working with both cities to try to expand uh, the use of uh, public transit so that more students can participate in uh, dual enrollment at GTCC and participate in our magnet programs. So, so, no, I can't say today that if these schools were open today that we could transport them. But I, I can tell you that the cities are working with us on expanding public transportation. And we do have uh, passes available to students uh, in the, uh, the city areas to use the public transportation. But it has to be expanded. And again, this isn't a uh, issue or a challenge that the district can resolve. It has to be resolved by the county and the cities. Okay. And then let me ask you one more question as far as support for the students. How, be, because, I mean, you're in one department, but how do these kids get the kind of support either from counselors or whatever they need, I mean, you, you know, need to make sure that they get where you want them to be or where they want to be. You understand the question? Yeah. Uh, so um, we have our co college and career managers that assist with direct career advisement. They're at each high school site. But our um, guidance and counseling department does a great job. In the last two years, we've become very collaborative in the work where they can um, also um, regurgitate the um, CTE elevator speech that's at the beginning. So we worked really hard in kind of bridging that gap so that advisement is around career and college readiness. But we can do better. We absolutely because, can. Because um, not all of the counselors understand that career technical education is not the vocational education of old for students who uh, are not going to college. So we do lots of training with counselors monthly to make sure they understand uh, what our CTE offerings are. Also, um, principals and, and schools tend to be very protective of their students. So if you're a student, and, and I'm just doing this naming a school, at Southern, for example, you don't want to lose your student to Dudley. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to get them to understand every school will have great CTE programs, and students will be able to go to programs across the district. So if one of your student leaves to go to Dudley, there will be a Dudley student who will come to yeah. uh, Southern for their uh, agri, agri, agri-tech agri mm -hmm. program, <laughs> a biotech program. Yeah. Will these be available to in places like uh, public libraries or recreation centers, um, you know, so that that as much as we can, I mean, they're, 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 they're nice, but I don't want them to sit on a shelf somewhere. I want them to be out here in the community to help us to have somebody that can at least, you know, call and ask a question as yeah. far as getting their kids in, in you know, in these programs. We can surely so. look at that. Well, how much do they cost <laughs> before you answer? Very exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, well, I'm thinking about that philanthropic donor she was talking about. So, yeah, but yes, that does make a difference. I just want to make sure she can afford it. Well, she says yes. Well, the, the, the cost of this, I mean, I, I'm be, I'm, the cost of this is, is that when we, when we have those kids walk across that stage, and we know that they are ready to go. Yeah. I think that that's where our investment is. So if it means, you said that what you had 68% of the students uh, in high school that were in the CTE programs, where would you like to see it be? Yeah. 90%, you know, so this, 
is an expense that we can do, Dr. Contreras. I, I, I'm sure that, you know, you might make us a donation before you leave. I'm, te I'm teasing Ebony because she's just saying yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Exciting. All right. Thank you very much. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Linda? How much flexibility, like, all right, how many kids go to, to college thinking they want to be an engineer and then switch majors, all right? Um, once, all right, do we start in the ninth grade and we have to stay in the pathway all the way through, or is there flexibility in there? Do you understand what I'm asking? I'm going to take a stab at it. Okay, so CT is very unique. You have an opportunity after 2018 when Perkins legislation changed that said that for a student to be a pathway completer, you had to take two courses. However, we know in pathways like healthcare science, you need to have a specialization. So you need to go into a third course because you want to sit for the certified nursing assistant certification. So by law, it's two courses that a student needs to take to be a concentrator. But level of mastery might be two, three courses, might be four courses. So when you say, do they have to stay? Yes, freshman year, sophomore year, could possibly be a concentrator. And then you decide that CTE is so important to my overall life goals <laughs> that you then do another pathway in 11th and 12th grade. So okay. students have multiple options. Um, at first, there was this resistance across states like, oh, it's only two courses. But that's when we looked at creating these precise sequences and really looking at what students, students needed to take to master a skill or trade, obtain a credential, and walk away with skills. And what I mean by that is if you go to a doctor's appointment and it's just you getting um, your blood drawn. You want whoever your CNA is or your CMA to find your vein the first time, first prick. So we want to make sure our students leave with a certain level of mastery. I always tell them they got one shot. Exactly. <laughs> Not into the multiple sticks. Um, okay, and then, you know, we're talking, well, number one, engaging engaged learning mm -hmm. is critical and that's what you get with CTE type teaching and curriculum. Uh, whereas sitting in a classroom being lectured to is not as engaging. So I can see like sports that CTE can keep children in school and engaged. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I had one of both. I had one major CTE guy and I had one that was more tradi traditional AP. and depending on the student. But if you've got these that are kind of, uh, you know, just kind of out there in the cloud a little bit, if you can get a hands-on um, engagement where they're actually engaging with equipment, they're engaging, going to businesses, seeing how it can actually happen, you can keep them engaged. Whereas sitting in a classroom over here and just being lectured to, they're drifting off, they disengage and they don't want to be there. So I have both. And so I see that. Um, so I'm excited. You're doing a great job. Um, also with colleges right now, we have too many kids graduating from a four year degree and still having no pathway, okay? We don't do a good job. You know, they just say, well, even with a biology, a four year biology degree, you have to go another level unless maybe you're gonna teach to engage in that high level technical situation. So when you're doing this, you're actually creating a pathway directly into a career because a lot of children are coming out of college that are not ready for a career. So I think that's awesome. So I'm, I'm very excited and always have been. Now I'm going to ask one more question. We at one point said we were, are we thinking about how was traditional versus block scheduling going to impact this major push forward with CTE? So, so um, I will share within the last two weeks, our CTE curriculum and instructional management coordinators went out um, to Northeast and just giving this as an example and really trained the teachers and leadership staff around going from block to a seven period. And they were ecstatic. 
Now, that may not have been everyone, but for the feedback that we got overall, they were ecstatic. We talked about what it looks like to um, move into that type of schedule, to plan your um, lesson plans accordingly, using explicit instruction, making sure that each student has an opportunity to have a direct explanation, the modeling, the guided, the independent, and then the assessment as well. And so um, we don't see that as, as being an issue and where our schools already were on a seven period, our students are, are excelling and doing okay. well. So uh, let me, all right, on traditional, we have how many hours of our classes or how many courses do, can we get? I know with um, block, I think it's 24. You can Yeah, do. I don't have the and numbers. Then, so are we have, do we have enough, I guess, extra slots to fit in the CTE? Because like you said earlier, it does not count towards your core requirements for graduation necessarily. It's electives. Mm -hmm. So for, for them to follow a pathway, which we're saying in some cases they may need four courses, how does that work out traditional versus block? Well, remember we did a modified block. Mm -hmm. So in the new schedules, there is some blocked classes and some single classes. And we did that intentionally to address CTE courses and students who still needed courses to graduate. So Dr. Chillis played a role in that. You may recall the first two periods of every traditional schedule and the last two periods are blocked to address CTE courses. Okay. I'll talk to you later and okay. just see the math and how all that pawns out, if that's okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, I just have a, um, one question, but I, I really appreciate Dr. Contreras talking about the, the counselors. Um, years ago, the Hub Advisory and MWBE director uh, would work very closely with the counseling department. I mean, our counselors are doing so much already, but just didn't know. Um, and I think it goes back to what Dr. Contreras said, people have an antiquated view of CTE programs from the sort of vocational, um, uh, you know, sort of culture and how different this is. You know, if anybody's done any home improvement project, you probably want to keep an electrician, you know, as part of your family budget. Um, because it's so hard to get plumbers and electricians and engineers and concrete and everything, everything, drywall. <laughs> I could just go on. Um, so I'm really, really excited about this personally and just, um, just for the students and the incredible opportunities that they'll have. But when, you know, when you look at what, um, you know, a lot of these um, sort of credential skilled um, um, folks can make, it, it is, you know, it is a wonderful livelihood. Um, and um, if if the sort of college track isn't for you, um, you know that, and and then the college debt, and then all of the things that come with that, it's just an incredible opportunity. And to have both of them, to be able to, you know, if you're um, if you're on that college track, to be able, also able to have a credential is fantastic. And so I just feel your enthusiasm. I could tell you you love this this piece of work here, and we're excited to have you. Um, you talked about the enrollment gap that's narrowing, but we still have one, and the graduation gap. Um, are you tracking the credential gap? Because uh, years ago when we, um, in our CTE program, we had uh, the largest population of students enrolled were students of color, mm -hmm. but they were the students least likely to complete the programs with the credentials. So they weren't able to enter the workforce immediately um, and, and take advantage of that experience. So are we keeping up with the credentialing gap? Yeah, so that was um, one of the first things that I started to look at when I, I got here. And so we'll have some of that data to share so that we have some comparison data, especially once um, the state changed what was a concentrator and what was a credential and all of that. So I'll be able to share some of that data. Great. All mm -hmm. right. There's, there's more than just that. There's also who's in what program. So one of the mm -hmm. issues I still have is the CNA program. Mm -hmm. You can't buy a home being a CNA unless you say for years and years. I just think it's a problem who's going in there, who's getting the credential as opposed to who gets one in cybersecurity. So I think we have to pay attention to gender, to um, race, and even if they're earning a credential, 
what sort of wages will they earn as a result of the credential that they earn? So how do we encourage uh, girls and which to go into programs and which programs do we encourage them to go in uh, to? And do are we encouraging black and brown girls to go into a CNA program uh, and other girls to go into uh, cybersecurity programs? It's important that we look at all of that data. Yeah, because I can imagine tracking can occur yeah. through these and the advice and yeah. um, guidance of the adults in your life as well who may think this, you know, is, um, you know, adequate. Yeah. Uh, for students. And just want to add, it's one of our federal performance indicators, so non-traditional enrollment participation and completion. So it is something that we, we look at Great. most recently. Great. Thank you. Betty? Thank you. Yes. Um, I have met with a couple of organizations throughout this week, and they're looking at some CT programs. That's for the 18 through 24, not, not to give the kind of school age, but <clears throat> seems like that is the up and coming thing as far as being very, very vigilant um, in the city. And I know we didn't have as many before Dr. Contreras came on board. So um, I was so kudos to Dr. Contreras for the vision. We know she's visionary. And kudos to you, Edmund, because of the fact you took the ball and ran with it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, no more questions. Thank you so much for Thank this you. information and your presentation of it. Thank you. Uh, we are now at a closed session. And Anita, I'll turn to you. Oh, I turn to Deborah. I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney client privilege and to discuss personnel matters protected by state law and to give advice and instruction to our attorney and staff regarding certain real properties. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We are going to recess for closed session.
All right, we are now back in open session. We are under action items, and action item A is uh, surplus properties. I'll turn to board member Diane Bellamy Smalls. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion for us to um, to approve the resolution to uh, make the two properties discuss surplus properties. And which properties are those? Um, Irwin. Erwin Montessori. Montessori and uh, Hampton. School site? Yes. I'd like to second. All right. Any discussion? Um, we probably need to. Jill, if you could just say a little bit about the process um, as the board votes. So, so board members, uh, as you'll recall from having done this before, but we haven't done it in a long time, so I'll be happy to go over the process again. In order to dispose of any public property owned by a school system, you have to first make the determination that it is unnecessary and unusable for public school purposes, which you do by resolution and which Diane has just voted to do for these two properties, Hampton and Irwin. Uh, you'll recall those two schools were damaged severely in the tornado, have no more HVAC systems in them, have all kinds of issues. So by declaring them surplus, the first thing you, this is the first step you take by statute, which is to declare them surplus. Then you offer them to the county commissioners for fair market value, and the county commissioners have the first, sort of a right of first refusal by statute to choose to purchase those schools if they would like to. Uh, if they don't choose to purchase those um, schools, there's a statute, there are several statutes actually, that give you options on how else you can dispose of public property. Um, and when you have disposed of those properties, then you uh, can use that money for other things. And you also can, uh, needless to say, free up the maintenance and other costs that you have, insurance that you have associated with those properties. So, so there's all kinds of ways it's financially beneficial. Some of the ways you can dispose of property is by getting a written offer to purchase. And somebody who makes a written offer to purchase has to follow the statutes in 160A. They're around 297, if anybody's listening and interested. Somewhere around there. It, it, start in that area um, and if they submit to you a written offer and post the appropriate amount of money uh, associated with their offer as a bond then you can choose to accept that offer and you would then advertise for upset bids and upset bids anybody who posts more than 10 percent more than the bid before uh, that process goes on until you have a final winner. In other words, nobody else has upset the bid. So that's the most common way we dispose of property, but not the only. There's also other auction options and some other options, intercity, tran uh, intergovernmental transfers, other options we have. But we've used upset bid as the most common one. And to anyone listening, we welcome offers on either of these properties. We'd be uh, happy to entertain any interest. Great, thank you so much for <clears throat> uh, making sure that all of the details were explained clearly. Um, so if there are no questions, we can go ahead and vote if you can use your. Thank you. We did, she had a family emergency. All right, that passes by a vote of seven to zero. All right, we are now at, um, <clears throat> um, we also have an addendum to the personal action report. Diane? Madam Chair, I'd like to make an addendum to the personnel report for the following uh, positions, uh, administrative appointments for principal, executive director, and chief. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, um, I'll use your devices here. Dr. Funderburk, if you can clear that for us again, thank you. All right, that passes unanimously. I'll turn to Dr. Contreras. Thank you for your support. Um, I'd like to appoint as the principal of Kirkman Park Elementary, Yahara Owens. Uh, appoint two principals to be determined. Their appointment, Calandra Davis and Abu Zayim. Uh, as the executive director of choice and magnet programs, Kimberly Robertson. As the executive director of Title IX, Karen Ellis. 
as the Executive Director of Transportation, Frey, Faye Crowder Phillips, and as the Chief Communications Officer, Tracy Lewis. Thank you and congratulations to all. Thank you. We are now at item B um, and I'll turn to uh, Policy Committee Chair Betty Jenkins. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the policy 3625-9305, which is the school mascot and symbols as presented. Second. Thank you, Anita. Um, I didn't see any input. Can you turn your um, oh, yes. mic on? I did not see any input in my packet. Was there not any? None? Any input for the policy um, that's up for vote there were no comments from the community okay thank you all right any questions all right please vote all right that passes by a vote of six to one thank you and we are now at our monthly vote on universal face covering and mask requirement is there a motion I'll second. Uh, what's your motion? <laughs> what are you motioning? Uh, to continue current masking policy. Okay, and that's what you're mm -hmm. seconding. All right, any discussion? All right, please vote. It is? All right. All right, that passes by a vote of six to one. Thank you. And this is the last time they have to vote, is that right, by legislation? I am delighted to say that I have recently noticed, that I did not notice before, by the way, that there is a little provision at the beginning of that paragraph that says for the 21-22 school year. So I think we can fairly argue we are done. My gift to Dr. Oakley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are now at uh, board member comments, and uh, Nita, I'll start with you. I'd just like to say I had a wonderful time at graduation. They're always exciting. Um, everything went well. It flowed well. The kids were excited, mostly behaved. Um, that includes some staff, too, but uh, um, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, Deborah? Uh, Betty. I also let the echo about the graduations. Um, I thought that it went very well. Also, the promotion ceremonies with the fifth graders that's going to sixth grade and the eighth grade is going to ninth grade. I think I attended several of those and that went very well. The parents, of course, um, very ecstatic about that. And also, I thank the staff the administrators, teachers, all for thinking um, about our kids and loving our children and for keeping them safe. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, yes, um, I'm glad that we were able to attend the graduations and see some of the principals that I don't didn't have a chance to see this year, um, but it's always an exciting time and I'm glad that I had my last child graduate from Penn Griffin School for the Arts, so whoop whoop for Joshua Irby Shabazz, um, who will be going to college um, in the fall, and who did get accepted into the New York City um, Conservatory Music Program over the wow. summer. So that speaks loudly about the CTE initiatives, right? The performing arts work that is being done at Penn Griffin School for the Arts. It has been a great choice for my two children. Um, and I just want to also shout out Penn Griffin for um, reducing their suspension data um, because of best practices that they have put in place to keep students safe. Um, the arts teachers have been um, escorting our students in more places and having more eyes on students. So it did reduce a lot of incidents and things at um, that particular school. So I just wanted to shout out um, that administration 
um, for putting some safeguards. That like those are the things principals are doing and making happen, and they're not doing it alone. Everyone has buy-in about these procedures, so the teachers have buy-in, the students have buy-in. So I believe we have really. Um, they have really reduced their suspension because um, they had a high suspension rate um, at that particular school. So they are doing some great work there um, that should be looked at. Um, I also want to shout out to Miss Day, who's at Penn Griffin, who is a semifinalist um, for Teacher of the Year. Um, she was a middle school teacher, a math teacher, and then she became our high school um, math teacher. And shout out to the Learn to Swim program. Congratulations to Dr. Contreras and to Diane Bellamy Small for holding on to that vision um, and just hearing about the results. Um, all my children swim, thank goodness. Um, and I have one lifeguard, certified lifeguard, um, one of my children. And it is a great um, task. And my mother was one of those mothers that did not want me um, near water and the beach and things like that. So that is a real fear um, lots of times for families um, as well. And please take advantage of the free summer camps that we're offering as well. Um, and, and June 21st, there will be a free health fair in High Point at the High Point Library. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Linda? Again, I enjoyed all the graduations. Um, it was exciting to see these kids walk across the stages. They're so excited and they're bright and they're just ready for a new, new beginnings and new challenges and adventures. Um, I also wanna do a shout out for the um, bow and salutatorian luncheon. Uh, that was very nice. Um, I really got to talk these, you know, you get to hear, um, you know, what their plans are and, you know, we're talking bio in bio engineers. We were talking all sorts of, but one young lady, I really liked her. Um, she wants to be a professional trainer for like, um, you know, a, a professional or a, no, no, no. It's a psychologist, a, a psychologist for, um, you know, professional athletes. And that was a, kind of a neat thing that she set that goal because, you know, I think about tennis all the time. It's a mental game. Mm -hmm. And it was really neat to talk to her that she had set that as her goal to be a psychologist for a professional athlete because that's, hey, they, they need, well, it's money and they need you to win because I'm going to tell you, half the game is mental. I'm just going to say. So it was really exciting to talk to them, and um, I really enjoyed the luncheon tremendously. Um, also, I do want to recognize um, Dr. Alexander. She was great. I enjoyed working with her. And, uh, you know, she, she did a lot. She always would have, you know, was about reading and she was just a great person. And she was that calming force on this board in a lot of ways. And she was just, I, I just really enjoyed working with her. And um, I, my heart goes out to her family. Thank you. Diane. Um, first of all, I wanna uh, say I enjoyed uh, the, the graduations. I, I went to a total of 20 of them. Um, and we want to compliment the GCS staff and the Coliseum staff because it took a, coordinate, a coordinated effort. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, a lot of days of hard work because what we saw was the end result. We didn't see the rehearsals and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, um, I'm glad that they found uh, Andrews' uh, diplomas. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, stuff happens. But... Uh, you know, I think uh, everybody took it in stride and, and stepped up and, and got their job done. So it was good to see uh, Dr. Baycoat again. And she's uh, the consummate general when it comes to graduations. And you don't mess with her. She does it her way. But she gets it done. Um, secondly, I want to say a special thanks to the uh, <clears throat> eighth graders at Dr. MC, uh, Mel Melvin C. Swan Middle School. Um, um, they are learning, and uh, I think that uh, this was their first, you know, well, second graduation if you count kindergarten, I mean, count uh, uh, fifth grade. But 
uh, we have a lot of promise uh, in our children. And uh, as I told them whenever uh, I finished my speech to them, you are the wonderful world. So we want them to, to create the wonderful world that we uh, are struggling so hard to try to find. I want to congratulate my grandson, uh, Joshua J. Small, who graduated from North Carolina A&T Middle College. And uh, if you don't, I hope parents understand the value of what we offer in the school system and how hard our um, staff, principals, teachers, other staff uh, work to make it work. Because we can have programs, but we could just be collecting money. <laughs> getting a paycheck, but uh, you go well beyond. And from my heart as a grandmother, y'all sure worked a miracle with that one. So I appreciate it. <laughs> you laugh, I'm serious. <laughs> but, um, and I know Josh was not the only child that people made sure they got across that stage and hopefully will have productive lives. Um, as we celebrate Juneteenth uh, next week as a national holiday, I hope that we will look at that as more than just another shopping day. Um, we're not where Juneteenth supposedly would have us to be in this country. And so why celebrate a holiday if it has no substantial meaning? Um, we, we, we need to do a better job as Americans in um, making it so that everybody has the opportunity to have life lived in the pursuit of happiness. So if you would plan to go shopping for Juneteenth, don't, unless you're going to buy from African American vendors to help put that economic development back into those communities. But spend the time understanding what Juneteenth w was about and what this country was doing back then. So we stopped doing the same thing now. And then my last comment is simply that I want uh, our young people to be safe this summer, put down the guns, find a book to read or go online and read or volunteer. If you don't have a job, you don't have to stand on a corner and make trouble. Go somewhere and volunteer. We have community gardens. We have recreational programs. Find something positive to do so that we will see you at the beginning of the 2022-23 20, school year. Thank you. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I um, had the opportunity to attend the graduation at Swan Middle School. Um, Board member Diane Bellamy Small was the keynote speaker, and her speech was themed after "What a Wonderful World," and it was, and she sang at the end, and uh, it was a beautiful speech, and the kids were great. And uh, Juice Marmanis, thank you so much for um, turning that around and making that happen at the church because the school lost HVAC, <clears throat> so it was going to be a drive-by graduation, and and people were sad. And so thank you for that quick turnaround. It was, a, it was just an adorable middle school graduation. Um, I also <clears throat> really enjoyed the graduations at the Coliseum. It's the only time we get to really sit with staff. And so we, you know, we get to sit and eat and talk and learn about you um, because we just don't get to do that. We just pass each other, we get information, we ask questions. So I really enjoy laughing with you and learning more about you and your families. Um, <clears throat> I, I feel some kind of way sitting on the stage and looking out in the behind the students at the staff and the people that made it possible for them to be there. And um, I don't know, maybe we should sit in the back behind the students and let the staff sit on stage um, in the in the future um, because uh, without them, those students wouldn't be uh, <clears throat> uh, having that that in, incredible opportunity. Um, because graduating from high school alone impacts your health and your income and your housing opportunities and the likelihood of you coming, becoming involved in the criminal justice system. And so thank you so much to our staff. And I can't help but um, feel incredibly um, grateful and appreciative for the ROTC leadership. Every time 
um, the, the colors are presented. It is just uh, an, an, a, a proud moment in this country. My dad was a 30-year uh, paratrooper and, and combat soldier and command sergeant major, and um, he was an ROTC instructor at North Carolina A&T State University, and Colonel Burnett at the Hayes-Taylor Y was one of his students that spoke at his funeral last year, but um, ROTC was very important to him. And so um, every time I see those young men and women come out, it is, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So thank you. And there are a lot of Juneteenth events going on uh, this weekend in downtown Greensboro. Um, learn more about that. Come out and commemorate and learn more uh, this weekend. And thank you so much for, for everything that you all do. It's been a pleasure um, uh, in this journey with you. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second, second, second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Never. Thank you.